On this night, a strange melancholy falls over the great house, setting the stage for an unspeakable nightmare that awaits every unwary inhabitant of Collinsport, for they too will be touched by the terror at Collinwood. Welcome back to Terror at Collinwood. I am your hostess, Penny Dreadful, a.k.a. Danielle, and I have a very special guest with me today. I'm very excited that he is here. My guest today is Tom Diamond. He is one of the co-hosts of the Literary License podcast, where he also provides trivia and information for the show's Dark Shadows discussions. His voiceovers and impressions can be heard during the opening and closing credits of the show. He was professionally trained in voiceover at Edge Studios in New York City. Tom just loves voiceover work and welcomes any opportunity to perform. He uh, holds a master's degree in a public administration from NYU and is pursuing a doctorate in business administration with human resources specialization at North Central University. He worked as a senior investigator for the NYS Medical Board and also worked in human resources for major New York City agencies. Please welcome my guest, co-host of the Literary License Podcast, Mr. Tom Diamond. Hi, Tom. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing great. Um, wow! I just, I just thought I'd, I, I just thought I'd uh, surprise you with that one, Penny. Wow! I was, and, uh, uh, I, you didn't mean to startle me, I, uh, the, but you did. I'm sorry. Did <laughs> I, I almost fell off you? Widow's Hill there? Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. But you know, did I startle you? Was uh, the, uh, the, the one of the prime things that uh, Dark Shadows did? But yeah, I, I and, and I'm going to call you Penny. I didn't know whether you wanted to be called Miss Dreadful. I didn't. Uh, I, sometimes I don't know if that. I Kind of, kind of gets to you, um, uh, AKA Danielle. But, uh, but seriously, thank you so much for having me here. It's absolutely a pleasure to cross over from the crypt of uh, literary <laughs> license podcast. Um, yes, where, uh, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, uh, where you have evil, evil lurks here. Daniel Tease has uh, come with me. Uh, <laughs> oh, they brought the with... caretaker. Wonderful. Absol absolutely. Well, absolutely. Uh, I don't know uh, how you got him to leave Eagle Hill Cemetery. It's, that's an impressive feat. It was because there was no help for him. But, uh, <laughs> but, but seriously, I'm extremely pleased to be here and uh, to talk to you about various and sundry. And hello to all your fans. Literary License uh, Podcast, of course, as uh, you know, uh, we tape it the uh, fourth Friday uh, of every month. Uh, and it's usually out uh, the weekend after. And mm -hmm. it's once a month. But starting in September, we're going to go to twice a month. So yeah. uh, so we look forward to, to all of you on there. But uh, I'm going to I'm going to now close the door of the crypt and let you uh, <laughs> let you pontificate. Go yes. Well, well, as as I tend to do, pontification is, is so my I. is my bag. So, uh, so, so yeah. I. Yeah. Um, so this is, this is a perfect crossover then. So you're you're definitely uh, when I first announced a while back on about six, seven months ago on Facebook that I was going to be launching a Dark Shadows podcast. I had left Facebook for a while and uh, uh, came back and with the podcast and you reached out to me uh once i launched it you know and we uh we arranged a, a crossover so i'll be on literary license in a, in a few weeks as well so that'll be yes, fun that's absolutely we doing hope the to crossover. have you on yeah, like, we hope to have you on. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, Tom, please tell us a little bit about your background with Dark Shadows and uh, your involvement with the fandom. You've you've been uh, involved with the with the fan community for quite a while, oh, and yes. you have a, a lot of wonderful experiences with Dark Shadows, having gro uh, grown up in New York. And uh, talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I'm a Brooklyn native, first of all, and I and I'm sure you can all hear my New York accent, my Brooklyn accent. Never would have uh, guessed. Never would have. Uh, guessed. <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, you know, well, you did it. You did it. Uh, and uh, and uh, and I actually uh, did start uh, watching Dark Shadows from the bowels of Bensonhurst, so to speak, when I was oh, I would say in uh, in junior high school, and that was around 1960. That was around 1967. I caught a little of the 1795 segment back then mm -hmm. but i really it was like a kind of off and on thing a friend of mine told me about it and i really wasn't into it until i happened to tune it in 
one day at another friend's house who watched it religiously. And that was about the time Laura Parker as Angelique the Vampire came on. Mm -hmm. And I took one look and I was hooked. The adolescent in me uh, <laughs> was uh, was absolutely amazed at the at the at, at the beauty and the fangs and the combination of same and 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 that was it. My only regret was that he had a color set and I had a black and white. So after that one or two excursions, then I had to watch it. But I watched it religiously from the, uh, from that point on. And uh, I remember going to, when I had to go to high school. I came. I had to come home at. 20 after four. And at that point, uh, Shadows was on at four o'clock. And so I missed the first 20 minutes. I was absolutely bereft. And I actually had a cousin of mine tell me what was going on, but he wanted to charge me for it. And at that point, his <laughs> aunt stepped in. My aunt stepped in, I should say. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he wanted he wanted to charge you money for information about the show. Wow. He, he did indeed. <laughs> yes, that's how far he realized. Well, he was a fan, but he was trying to take it to another level. And uh, I didn't exactly appreciate that. I don't mind saying that all these years later. He's gone now. He's he's not oh, on this I'm earth sorry. anymore. But that's all right. Uh, but uh, the bottom line. Is, is we were all kids back then anyway so i did watch it religiously whenever i my, whenever my parents took me up to the catskills it, we couldn't get that we couldn't get abc in in upper new york state because back then you had you didn't have cable you had uh, the antenna and uh, so i would be bereft until i got home and then of course i'd see it again uh, flash forward to april 2nd 1971 the date that will live in infamy and uh, the last day, the last day of the show, mm -hmm. I could not believe it. I couldn't yeah. believe it. Nobody Heart could believe heartbreaking. it. Heartbreaking. Oh, oh, oh my God. We, we, you know, we knew about it a month prior because TV Guide announced it. Right. But we well, still couldn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe it. I expected it to be on the following Monday. And then when I saw Password reruns I with Alan Ludden, I wanted to drive a stake through Alan Ludden's heart, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, and, uh, so that was, so that was that until the late seventies. And, uh, so I, I'd had the, the, you know, the LP, uh, the Robert Cobert records and mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, but that was about it. And, uh, so fla flash forward. And then, then I heard all of a sudden that it had been released on syndication. It hadn't come to New York yet, but it was on a uh, Philadelphia, in a Pennsylvania UHF station, Channel 49, if I remember correctly. And I remember, oh my God, I got so excited. So what I did, of course, we I couldn't get that on the regular TV. So I had a small little portable with uh, with a UHF, those circular those uh, circular antennas, mm -hmm. if you remember that back then. Yep. And I and I and I positioned it by a fire escape window that I had and uh, then it wasn't coming in great then I then I had an idea and I took a metal lazy Susan and used that metal as a reflector against oh, the antenna good idea wow and, Brilliant. A, and a cousin thank you and a cousin of mine who was an engineer said yeah that that did it that amplified the reception uh -huh. so I was able to watch I was able to I couldn't believe it there it was again oh my god <laughs> But they only had it on for a little while, and then then no more. And on bad days with the rain, uh, when it was cloudy and stuff, you couldn't get a good reception. So all I got was snow. But that had to satisfy me until Dark Shadows came back to New York, and NBC uh, picked up the the first six months uh, post uh, post Barnabas, which is episode two ten, and NBC picked that up. And I had no idea that it was happening. I was watching the news one day. With Chuck Scarborough, Scarborough, if anybody remember, knows the you know the New York area, and that was a six o'clock news, and I happened to turn it on, uh, or five o'clock. I don't remember. He might have had an early thing. And all of a sudden, there's Jonathan Frid being interviewed uh, by Chuck Scarborough regarding Dark Shadows. Wow! I almost fell out of my chair. <laughs> I mean, incredible. And, I, and then, of course, they talked about the fact that it was coming on and it was seen. It's They started to show it on 430 in the afternoon, right before the news. I watched it religiously. I was hooked as uh, once again, my childhood had come back. Uh, but unfortunately, it was not picking up. And after a few months, 
they relegated it to three o'clock in the morning. And so I, and, and so I'd get up and I think I was living with my mom at the time and she was not happy that I get up at three in the morning <laughs> for that sort of thing. But yeah, I, uh, you know, and I saw it till the end and then that was, and then that was that. Mm-hmm. Then I heard about the dark shadows conventions. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but before I, but, but before that happened, when that, when the show came on NBC, I was so thrilled that I wrote a letter to the station manager uh, of uh, WNBC TV New York, praising him and his people for putting that back on. And I said, everybody ought to get a raise and, and so forth. Well, the next thing you know, it was a few weeks later and I got a call from somebody, one of the, one of the, one of the suits at NBC inviting me to a party uh, that was being given uh, in conjunction with the uh, New York Blood Drive at Le Magique, uh, which was yes, now, I'm yeah. not sure whether that was the original studio and it had turned into a disco. I'm not sure about that, but it was, but it was some, but anyway, they were giving that with Le, at Le Magique. And so it was going to be Jonathan and, and the actor who played. Uh, Zachary. Well, Zachary, that was the yeah, other John, thing. John Zachary, right? Yeah. Zachary, Zachary, yeah. Zachary. Oh, oh, wonderful. Well, <laughs> that is a good do. Zach. That is a good Zachary. So Barnabas yeah. and Zachary in the same room. I've seen pictures of this event. And every time mm-hmm. I see a picture of them together, I wish that I could, you know, use the I Ching to send myself <laughs> back in time to go to that event because that is so oh, cool would, that you were, oh, you you were there. It. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm also thinking of the of the of the kid that played the Leviathan and I'm blanking out on his Oh, name. Michael Maitland? Michael Maitland. Yeah, may rest yeah. in peace. Yeah. Michael Maitland was there also. He was an adult at that point, but mm-hmm. he popped by to say a few words and wow. uh, then he left. But uh, th- so I was expecting to meet Jonathan. I was told, Jonathan wants to meet you. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh my God. So I went with a friend. So, well, we got there and we listened to all the, you know, the stuff that you probably saw. And then they went up to a private party upstairs. Well, guess what? I was told, no, you're not allowed. You're not invited. You know, and I was really mad. Uh, so, uh, so it was a bait and switch uh-huh. as, as we call it. Well, but uh, what, what did I do? I waited until after there was a security guard by a staircase leading up to the upper area. So I waited until, you know, the place practically cleared out and my friend and I just approached him and, uh, in a very sedate, calm tone without the horror laugh, which I just gave you yeah. because then I would have been thrown out, but no, but, but in a sedate tone, you know, I uh, explained the situation and he, and he led us upstairs and which, and the guy saw me there and oh, was he always oh, was that suit mad. <laughs> but, uh, and he said, all right, you made it, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> what an SOB he was. Oh, you know, gosh. Yeah. About, yeah. I'm not yeah. talking about style of brisket. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but yeah. So Jonathan was sitting, uh, talking to people. I came up to him. I waited politely until he finished talking to whoever. I walked up to him and I said, Mr. Frid, my name is Tom Diamond. And I wrote a letter. You wrote that letter. <laughs> you wrote that yeah oh he brightened up immediately oh that's oh, great <laughs> oh my god he said do you know what happened with that letter i said no that letter went up to the vice president of nbc i go huh you know i mean like wow so we talked for a little and i said you know i'm really glad that letter helped he goes he looked at me and he goes well it worked <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great that's so cool I, and i came home that night on the subway and i felt like i uh, my fair lady and i could have danced all night you know it's, <laughs> it sounds silly uh for a grown man to say something like that but you know i but i but of course i was a devoted fan of the show sure. and now i actually i never never in a million because i did not I, I did not go to the studio. It was not one of those uh, privileged people that was allowed to go to the studio because my parents wouldn't let me uh, back, back then. I was 12 years old, whatever, and they didn't have time to take me. Uh, but I never in a million years thought I was going to meet him. I had no idea. So there you, so there you go. Right. Subsequently, I started going to the LA conventions and I met Kathy Resch, one of the greatest. Yes. She's a grand dom of Dark Shadows. Oh, I have to get Kathy on the show at some point because she is... For those who may not know, I mean, people in the Dark Shadows fandom, I think everybody knows who Kathy is, but uh, especially in the 70s and 80s and, and into the 90s too. I mean, Kathy 
all through the 90s, I would say Kathy was the cornerstone of the Dark Shadows fandom. She published the World of Dark Shadows uh, fanzine. Uh, she published the Concordances. She was an instrumental figure in the fandom and still is. I mean, she's still active actually on, on online. Uh, she's, she's in the Facebook groups and stuff. So definitely so cool. I got I met her brief, very briefly at one of the festivals too. And she was super nice. And I'm she is her. one of the sweetest yeah. gals. And uh, she when she chaired the convention, she and Marcy yeah. Robin. Yes, Marcy. Had, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when she and when they chaired the conventions, uh, especially Kathy, Ka uh, well, actually both of them really, but they treated you, they treated the fans like family. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, it was just, and of course they had them in Newark at that uh, at that time mm -hmm. at the new at the Gateway Hilton in Newark, and then they switched to New York afterwards. But uh, so uh, going, and of course they they alternated between L.A. and New York. Did you go uh, to the, sh the the Shadow Cons before the festivals started? Because I no, know there was that first, and then it was the festival. That's, yeah. that's correct. No, I didn't yeah. know about them. Uh, mm -hmm. I found out. I think the first time I really uh, found out about the uh, conventions was in the early '80s. Uh, you're talking about the late '70s. I think they mm -hmm. started in '77, and Carlin, John Carlin, may rest in peace, was guest star yeah. at the first one but yeah no those were pretty small those are pretty small affairs the first one actually was a room in another convention mm -hmm. uh yes, where, yes. They, mm -hmm. where they handed out uh you know various memorabilia uh but uh at the at one of the early cons uh there was a raffle and the and the people winning the raffle there were two there were two potential winners and uh you got to have lunch with jonathan uh, a brunch with jonathan on a sunday at a restaurant in marina del rey and i won i was one of the winners wow, I, was, cool. I wasn't even in the room they called me thank <laughs> god they did that because sometimes if you're in the if you're not in the room and you win they don't they you know it goes to somebody else but they weren't like that they were nice so they called me from somewhere else and said guess what you won and i go wow so <laughs> the next day uh, we went in a limo, uh, myself and uh, Jonathan, and one other person who won, and the poor gal, I, I, call, I still think of her as Josette for a day, because she was dressed in an 18th century costume. <laughs> the poor thing was so nervous, she didn't say a word. Tired, oh. oh, I felt bad for her. <laughs> starstruck. Were, she was starstruck, huh? But but I was going to get my chance. I didn't care, and yeah. I and so and I found out, and he and I had a marvelous conversation. That's great. And 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 I found that he was, and and may rest in peace, Jonathan was 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 a very bright guy, very intellectual, a very a, a wonderful conversationalist. He could talk to you about anything mm -hmm. uh which which really amazed me and uh we just we just spoke about various facets uh i recall the next morning the convention organizers were giving me weird looks because they didn't they expected me to keep my mouth shut uh but no 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 that's not me but anyway that was <laughs> That was all those years no. ago. Um, but uh, since then, then, of course, I started going to the New York conventions. Yeah. And um, I would go to both the Jim Pearson cons. Jim Pearson kept it going for 50 years. And Jim Pearson ran and the Dark Shadows festivals and really is still in charge of, of that. If, yes. if, you know, he's Jim Pearson is, for those who may not know, is also an extremely instrumental figure in the Dark Shadows fandom. It's like Kathy and and Jim, Kathy and Marcy and Jim, especially through all those years, uh, kept the Dark Shadows flame going. And Jim is still, he works for Dan Curtis Productions. He, he, he was hi hired by Dan Curtis and worked can handles all the dark shadows you know merchandising licensing all of that stuff goes goes through jim well so. he works for mpi and now yeah, and yeah. uh i will tell you that i remember when jim was just a, a very smiling bright and if he was listening to this he'd probably smile i remember when he was <laughs> just another fan uh <laughs> from Texas that came to the conventions and he was, uh, you know, it was, uh, and, and he was given a tremendous opportunity, yeah. uh, which he took. And, uh, he is, there is no doubt that he's, you know, he's respond, he's responsible for keeping the flame. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd like alive. to get, get Jim on here at some point too. I know he died. I've heard him on one podcast, but I think he, he rarely does a podcast. I, I, yeah, no, he rarely does it. And, uh, uh, but he, uh, you know, but anyway, so, um, so there was that. And then when I, and also there, they, there was a, a kind of a, 
a side convention called Manhattan Shadows. Oh, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. And those were run by Pat and Josette Garrison. Mm -hmm. I and remember I remember hearing about that. I didn't I never really knew too much about it, but I remember seeing ads for it in the mm -hmm. zines and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, the Pat and, and they ran an, and they ran a fanzine called the Parallel Times. That's right. That's how I knew about it. I used to get Parallel Times. I had a couple you know, issues of that. There, yeah. There you go. Whereas <laughs> yeah. Kathy did Shadowgram. So that no, was Marcy. Times. Marcy did. Oh, Mar Marcy. Well, Marcy, Kathy, but Kathy, yeah. you know, they contribute because oh, yeah, uh, yeah. they work together. Sure. And, um, and of course, yeah, you had other designs as well. You had uh, Dale Clark's thing. Uh, the you know, Inside the Old House. Inside yeah. the Old House. That was house. a really good one. Yeah, Inside the Old and House. And the Dark Shadows Concordances by I love Kathy. those. Uh, those yeah, were, I wish uh, she would still. I know it's kind of at this point, you know, in the age of the internet, we have the, the fandom wiki and stuff, but I wish still that Kathy would somehow release the 1897 volume two concordance. Remember she, the 1897 concordance before those episodes were in syndication, mm -hmm. and, but then mm -hmm. she did, she re-released it as like a, an illustrated version, but by the Absolutely. late great Warren Odson, who was brilliantly yes. talented. And yes. I, she never did the volume two of the 1897. Like, oh, yeah, I'd love to love it if she did, but amazing. Just have a complete um, set, you know? <laughs> well, anyway, I started a, so I went to the Manhattan Shadows Cons. Yeah. Uh, Joe Crothers, that was one of the few oh, ones yes. that Joe Crothers yeah. attended. Yeah. Uh, Joe Haskell and so forth. Uh, Jonathan and the Garrisons were good friends. Mm -hmm. And so Garris and so Jonathan was at them. He, he Mm -hmm. uh, Addison Powell was at one of yes one of I've watched some video footage of that which was, was yep, really cool yep, yep. yeah uh, he also Jonathan also brought some of the technical people on uh, into the Manhattan Shadows uh, oh great and, and they had some and there are a couple of uh, there are a couple of things uh, going on uh, going around I should say uh, where the, you know and you probably still hear that uh, on YouTube or something where they actually uh uh, you know, it, it was very in, in, in terms of the in terms of the technical side of the show and uh, how they mm -hmm. were really one of them said we knew right away this was going to be a hit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, during that time, at one of the conventions, I was asked to handle security okay. and Jonathan was the only guest at that particular one. And I had another opportunity. I guarded him while they, while he was waiting to come on for an appearance. And he was in a hotel room and he and I had a talk uh, once again. Uh, and it was just, uh, you know, cause he was, I just went in and he was just waiting there and he was, he was there alone. And so we just started talking again. And that was another opportunity uh, for me to get to know him. And then I got a call from the people in Jim, one of the people in Jim's group, uh, Jonathan was rehearsing uh, for his uh, first one man show. Mm -hmm. And uh, he lived in, in New York City in the Gramercy Park area, uh, not too far from Beth Israel Hospital, actually, for people who are interested in, uh, who are interested uh, or know about that. And uh, I was invited as one of the people to, he needed an audience. Yeah. So I was invited as one of the people. So I went there uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, wow, that's so cool. To his apartment to watch him his rehearse his one-man show, which was Fools and Fiends or Fridiculousness? Mm -hmm. It was Fools and Fiends. Fools and, and Fiends, yeah, yeah. yeah. I saw yeah. him perform that at Brown University, and he was amazing. Just such a great, compelling performance that he gave uh, to that audience. And then afterwards, he had a Q&A, and he was so friendly and charming it was it was great I'm so glad I got to see him perform live but how cool that you were in his apartment watching him like prepare we, and, we, and rehearse it yeah I I was I just felt so privileged and uh I you know I brought the and then something I was seeing at the time uh, mm -hmm. hi Holly if she listens to this out in Rhode Island uh <laughs> take over this was oh, many many years ago but I'm still friends with her uh but uh she uh she went uh, I brought my, I brought a couple, I brought a couple of friends over and, uh, it was, uh, and, and he, and he was masterful. Uh, mm -hmm. there was no, and of course, Mary, Mary, Le Mary Leary, oh, sure. uh, yeah. uh, who, uh, you know, I'm good. I'm friends with, I'm friends with Mary. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had lost touch with Mary for many, many years and ran into her a few years ago when, uh, the Dan Curtis, 
uh, bio came out. They gave a little yeah. presentation in New York, and there yeah. she was. And for those who may not know, uh, she was Jonathan Fred's. She she was his co partner in Clunes Associates mm -hmm. with with the mm -hmm. uh, with his one man shows and touring and and productions that he would put on. So yeah, uh, she and Nancy Kersey also very she, good Nancy, of his. yeah, Nancy and, Kersey, uh, yeah, she's and great. Yeah, Billy McKinley. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, he's not William McKinley, but he was Billy McKinley back then, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, he was on. It was uh, it was it was really. And of course, Mary is a seven uh, time uh, Emmy Award winner in mm -hmm. soaps yeah, uh guiding yeah. light general hospital sure, yeah incredible career yeah. uh very bright and very very uh lovely person um anyway so uh, you know so we went so we went there a few times jonathan also liked to have it it was uh it was a tavern pete's tavern mm -hmm. uh seventh and 17th and second avenue in the city which was a very tavern that oh henry would use used to go in the 19th century and wrote oh. all his short stories in great and so jonathan loved that place and he and there were a couple of two there were a couple of small gatherings that jonathan had there mm -hmm. and uh i went to those and i and on my job and you mentioned my medical board job i used to run after bad docs in the real world mm -hmm. uh i was in that area once i had to go to beth israel uh and uh jonathan was walking down the street because he was right in the area mm -hmm. In point of fact, when he rehearsed in the apartment, you could hear the, I, I haven't thought of this in years, but you heard the hospital ambulances go by, <laughs> interfered. <laughs> he'd, be, he'd, be, he'd be doing the telltale heart and louder, <laughs> louder, louder. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, we'll stop there. I can't hear the rest of what he was starting uh, to say. The only thing that would get them to stop tape on Dark Shadows was Jonathan Frid cursing and <laughs> swearing during. <laughs> Uh, that is well. There were a couple of other things, you know. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a famous one with Grayson Hall going, "Why?" <laughs> oh yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, with Tony Peter, with uh, yes. Jerry Lacey's Tony Peter. Yeah, and that exists. And that's so cool that 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 still exists. You know that they put that as an extra on the uh, on the DVD because, of course, they very rarely stopped tape they, on the show because it was so expensive to to do so. So. Um, they all do. Yeah, the bloopers, uh, and, and I'm not going to speak too long about that. That's a million, because mm -hmm. I do a special segment on literary license yes, podcast, yeah. as you know, yeah. for the bloopers. So I'm the blooper expert. And <laughs> I will actually look at all the episodes in the block prior and and, and on, my, on my large computer screen, and, mm -hmm. be, and, and, and I'll be looking like, a, 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 like it's under a microscope and Can, looking yeah. at every little the thing that goes, but the bloopers yeah. were what made the show. Let me ask uh, you a question. It just, it sure. just brought something to mind. Um, sure. When the, the show originally aired, like over the air station, you said you had a, like a black, uh, the watching out on the black and white TV. Could mm -hmm. you see, like, I know a lot of the things like the wire opening, uh, what you can sometimes see the wire opening the book or something like that. Now, would that stuff show up? Cause now we have, you know, the high resolution yeah. TVs and stuff. Could you still see things like the wires? On those what a, TVs what or a, what a great question. And mm -hmm. no, you couldn't. Yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah. And and this is why Dan Curtis, uh, you know, the story was he didn't really want it was very expensive, first of all, to do mm -hmm. retakes uh back back in the day. Uh they shot live to tape. Uh the, you know, the 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 tape was uh, usually shuttled over uh for use by the ABC news people a mile down the uh, mile down the road. Um, so it cost a lot of money to redo a scene. So, and the actors used to complain, but we don't want them seeing us, uh, you know, uh, slipping mm -hmm. on the, uh, slipping on the floor or bumping up against the, uh, against the paper mache gravestones mm -hmm. or the, or the trees, knocking the trees over. And Curtis said, what are you worried about? People are only going to see this once. The housewives and teenagers are seeing this. Nobody's ever going to remember this show. Why? Well, uh, here it is, 50, 50 some odd years later, yeah. 60 years later. 55. We're going on 55, 55 years this later. month, as of June, 55 yeah. years. Yeah. And Curtis, may he rest in peace. Well, but I don't think he, he, 
he would, I think if he were alive today, he would be a little surprised. Yeah. No, uh, when, I, when I was a kid, my parents, they had a color TV in the living room and they gave me, they put the little black and white TV in my bedroom uh, when I was growing up. So I had my own TV, but it was, you know, the end, it was pre-cable. I had the antenna with the little aluminum foil flag that I would yep. put on it to also the get a better ears, signal. The sure, ears. the rabbit ears. Yeah. And, yep. and it was black and white, but I remember, you know, I remember watching it in the picture at the time. I didn't think of it as it's what I was watching TV. Sometimes it get snowy or scrambled or whatever, but sure. I wouldn't like thinking back to watching TV back then. I wouldn't imagine that you would see something like a little wire on a, on a book or something. Of course, some of the bloopers were very <laughs> prominent, like the, you know, the Charles Delaware Tate's curtains falling down like that, the drapes. That's falling right. Down. In, in like the, that's the very Evans said and, and the head. Yeah. And the... <laughs> yeah, but with and, the... and, and, yeah. and poor Jonathan, they, they caught him once uh, picking his nose. Um, right. Yes. That, 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 that's not one of the more flattering ones. And they played that at the conventions and you'd see him wince. When, yeah. Uh... I always, I always felt for, for the actors about that, because I know just as an actress myself, like I mentioned this in the first episode, just if I had a fan always coming up to me or somebody who went to a play I was in, and if I went up on a line during the, during the show and they said, oh, that was so funny. You went up on that line or you, you blew that line. And every time they saw me, they said that I'd start to wonder, did they actually like the play or did they like my mistake that I made in the play? You know, but that, I tend to be oversensitive yeah. that way, but I can kind of empathize with I think at this point now though I mean they kind of have embraced the fact that yes there were mistakes but like all show uh, dates especially daytime shows at that time the little that still exists you know of of those shows that that were on daytime television at that time there were errors and mistakes sure there that, were. that happened so sure there were it's yeah. it's just part and parcel of the uh, of the game and but it's funny because it mm -hmm. because you know the because the business of course one, one of the reasons for dark shadows is they played it up so seriously yes. and they were very uh and it wasn't camp some people say always oh, camp no no, no it wasn't nope. no it wasn't it was their attempt and of course it was and dan curtis of course the ultimate the ultimate credit goes to him brilliant mm -hmm. brilliant brilliant idea uh yes he stole from every horror classic novel in the book yep. uh and then some but it was it was an homage uh yeah. of, of 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 everything but it was framed in a now in a new light which was dealing with melodramatic soap opera which had never been done mm -hmm. uh, prior to this uh soap operas were boy meets girl boy boy gets girl pregnant boy marries girl girl mm -hmm. girl goes out with someone else dark shadows it was boy meets girl boy bites girl boy turns girl into vampire <laughs> Girl uh, run, starts running around with werewolf cousin. Uh, it was. <laughs> yeah, it, it was. He was taking the things he loved, use the soap opera format, using that format to do something different, to do something very unique. And it, and if you look back, I've mentioned this before to the history. Penny Dreadfuls. They were serialized horror stories. You know, uh, Sweeney Todd was was sure. a Penny Dreadful. Or going back to the to the earlier than that, the Shilling Shockers, Doctor Jekyll and Mister Hyde. It mm -hmm. was originally an ongoing uh, serialized story by Stevenson, and you didn't know at the time in the 19th century that uh, Jekyll and Hyde were the same person. But anyway, I think Curtis was pulling from his own interests and kind of using the soap yes. opera framework to do yes. what he wanted to do. He was a golf show producer, mm -hmm. but he had grown up with a love of the universal horror movies yeah. and uh, uh, the, uh, you know, and, and, and of course, the Karloff and Lugosi and right. so forth. And of course, no one was more surprised than Curtis and everybody else. Uh, as you know, mm -hmm. uh, Dark Shadow started out as a gothic romance. Yes. And, uh, the, and may and with the, of course you had the Laura character, which was an experiment uh, with the ghost kind of thing with Diana Malay, may she rest in peace, did a great job as Laura, yes, yeah. uh, both then and later in the 1897 segment. But they were in do danger of being canceled, and mm -hmm. the, his kids, you know, suggested his daughter said, "Well, why don't you put a vampire on it? A vampire? Well." Well, what the heck? Well, we got to lose, you know? Mm -hmm. we're, we're going down the toilet. Let's make anyway. it scary. Yeah, yeah. Make it really scary. And boom. And Jonathan yeah. came on. Sure. They they actually considered Bert Convy for the role. Can you imagine? Yes. What oh, that's... <laughs> 
we would I, not have I've we would heard, not have yeah. been talking here today yes i have i yeah i read i've i've read about that over the years and so i can't even imagine burt convy because of course <laughs> there, i think there was a conflict because uh, malcolm marmasine wanted somebody who he wanted to cast against type and wanted a you know a blonde sort of uh yeah. hunky actor to be the vampire and not bella lugosi and then he says after frid got cast and who did we cast bella lugosi you know somebody who actually looks like a vampire but curtis has always also been known for Curtis himself said, if anything, I cast on type, not against type. And it was right on the nose casting Frit. And I'm sure Ron Sprout also, as Frit pointed out, well, you know, they well. were friends from school and Ron Correct. Sprout had a, you know, probably had an influence there as well because Curtis was in England filming Dr. Jekyll right. and Mr. Hyde. So, right. but they sent pictures to him and he says he picked Fred because he was wearing a cape on stage and other people say that that he didn't cast Fred. So that I, I don't know what the truth is uh, and that I wasn't there. So I don't know. Curtis says, said he, he did pick Fred. Other people say he it didn't. Is, it is. So. <laughs> yeah, there are two different stories. Yeah. And I do commend you, by the way, you're, you're right on top of your DS lore. Uh, which is uh, which is great, uh, and and yeah, but but yeah, uh, and of course I heard the version that uh, that Curtis didn't even look at it, and the decision was made by Robert Costello, uh, mm -hmm. who the producer uh, mm -hmm. who was uh, working on it in New York while Curtis was in Europe, mm -hmm. and uh, but yes, Ron Sprout uh, and uh, and Jonathan had gone to Yale. Uh, mm -hmm. Jonathan has his had his uh, MFA from mm -hmm. Yale uh, with a directing, uh, directing mm -hmm. specialty. Yeah, and we and, went to Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts prior to that for, mm -hmm, for acting, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Absolutely, and so, uh, you know, and so and so that's what happened. But, get, but getting back to, um, you know, so yeah. I was there uh, when he started Arsenic and Old Lace on Broadway. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I went to uh, one of the, uh, uh, I, I didn't actually, see, did I see him in the play? I don't think oh, I saw yeah, him. Oh, yeah, he, he was Jonathan Brewster was Jonathan in Brewster. that. Yeah. When, and, uh, Larry Storch was in it. We playing the uh, Peter Laurie uh, role. And, correct. And Marion yeah. Mary Lauren from Happy yes. Days. They took all these classic Gene TV Stapleton. actors and cast Gene Stapleton. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yep. It's, uh, I got I got to dive in here too, because there is a history with arsenic and old lace of people who are known for horror roles playing Jonathan Bruiser, because of course, famously Boris Karloff did. And there's even the line in the show that he had plastic surgery to look like Boris Karloff because right. Karloff originated the role, but then uh, Raymond Massey played him in the movie. I, I, I believe Karloff wasn't available, I think. And then uh, Lugosi also played Jonathan Brewster on stage at one point, Bela Lugosi right. and Frid. And I, I believe other, other actors uh, cut from that cloth were also in, in that role. So it's really cool that he did play John from what from all I've heard he was sensational in the role we had hoped that uh that he was going to stage a real comeback and uh for a while it looked like it looked like he was because after mm -hmm. dark shadows ended Jonathan really took a lot of time off mm -hmm. and he uh and he he was very disappointed because Jonathan has always been a yeah Shakespearean Shakespeare was his first love yeah and uh and 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 he was he was not always comfortable with the Barnabas role yes and he did yeah. so well and then because he was so uncomfortable with it he told the story over and over again that he was very nervous about doing it and that translated into the Barnabas character mm -hmm. and so and so people really identified with the tortured tormented soul of the of the vamp the sympathetic vampire which was another first uh because up to that point vampires were evil mm -hmm. Uh, and they were they were blood drinkers, and Christopher Lee uh, didn't help that much with uh, with horror because that was the uh, the hammer was the sexual element. Not to say that that wasn't good. I mean, because I'm an Ingrid Pitt fan, I'll tell you, I love <laughs> I love the vampire lovers and Yuthi Stutzengard and Lust for a Vampire. Oh my God, Christopher. Uh, <laughs> Well, Christopher well, Lee was like an animal. Like he was feral when he was yes. when he went into Dracula mode. Like, he, and he was cold when he was, you know, speaking uh, to it was to, to Harker. Will. Yes, and yeah. Oh, oh, he's so good. He was. I love Lugosi too. I mean, I can't ever pick a favorite because I love them both equally for different reasons. Very um, true. Yeah, very, brilliant. Very, very well, true. Yeah. So, but Fred it, didn't want to be. I mean, that was his cl claim to fame was Barnabas. But he's he never saw himself as a horror no, actor. Turned no, down didn't. many horror roles. He played a couple uh, uh, in Seizure, the Oliver Stone's first film, and then Devil's Daughter. Yeah. He played the mute. Butler, he played the mute. That was such a such a waste of talent. I it know. Really I know. Anybody didn't want 
want to be, he was offered many from Nancy Kersey has talked about this before. She, he was offered yes. many horror she's roles the and he turned them all the down. Expert. Yeah, yeah no, she's the expert on it. Yeah. Now, and I don't know, and, and I had heard, but, but I think it's a rumor. And I think Nancy had never heard of it. Uh, I heard that he was actually, at one point he was actually offered they wanted him to do a toothpaste commercial as a vampire. Oh, was, I'm it, glad he didn't do that. <laughs> I'm glad he didn't do that either. Yeah. So he was really turned off and he, yeah. and he, and he went to Mexico and he learned Spanish and yeah. that's an amazing, I speak Spanish fluently from school. And I, I have to tell you, I never knew that I knew that I heard that he was starting to learn it, but I had never, I, I now understand that he spoke fluently. And I'm, I'm very sad that I never got the chance. Dark Shadows, by the way, in South America, has had the they were dubbed uh and and it was released in south america as sombras tenebrosas mm -hmm. and uh in in the, in the early 70s and it had a fandom and jonathan actually did a south american tour in after shadows ended in 1973 wow. curtis called him up and said you know there's a there's a market for this and so he and, and jonathan loved it he toured south america and yeah. argentina you and, know i wonder uh tom if that you know the lot the lost episode the video master for one single dark shadows episode it was one 12 19 12 19 yeah, yeah is yeah. lost is lost they have the audio thankfully josette they kernigan have. taped the audio but i wonder if somewhere in south america that tape exists you know like oh you never know go on an expedition an to south america to find the lost what episode. An <laughs> what an interesting thought i mean think of the spanish language dracula uh, carlos viarius mm. from 1931 yes yeah which had for many years uh, there was one copy in the Library of Congress, but that for many years that was considered lost. And then all of a sudden, something came, something turned up in Cuba of all places. Yeah. And and now you can get it anywhere because right. uh, it was so. So one never knows. But and that and then that lost episode, of course, uh, uh, Joseph, she was blind, uh, Joseph mm -hmm. Kerrigan, and, yeah. and so she had it on. She had the audio because yeah. she taped the. Uh, she had all the episodes on reel to reel. So yeah. they went ahead and. And then, of course, they did the stills and Laura Parker yeah, thank did the goodness. narration. You know, and, that's right. and thank God, thank God, yeah. really. Uh, you know, for... it's, yeah. And we're fortunate as Dark Shadows fans that that's the only, we at least have, we have the audio for that and they were able to reconstruct with stills. And it's only one out of uh, out of 1,225 Amazing. episodes. Well, Whereas Doctor Who, you know, th there are quite a few <laughs> stretches of Doctor Who, yeah, no, you know, that are missing. And they do have, uh, the fans I, also recorded audio for, for the Doctor Who, but there are quite know, a few of those that are missing yeah i was wondering about because i because I've, I've tried to get into doctor who from time to time and they have them on brit box mm -hmm. and uh i've seen whole stretches of, of episodes missing and i'm saying oh darn you know yeah. but but they have whatever whatever they do but once mm -hmm. again give dan curtis credit very smart he kept he bought those episodes from abc yes. yep and he paid money for it, I understand as well. And it's about, and so he was, so he, that's how they survived. He saved them he, and the kinescopes. Like it's amazing can, that that they yep. kept, he kept those. That's he kept awesome them. that he did that. Yep, <laughs> kept them and uh, very, very smart in his part uh, because ABC's copies, uh, there was a fire in the vaults in the early wow. 70s of the ABC studios. And so all those, so whatever copies uh, that shadows, in addition to a lot of soap, Poppers. But anyway, yeah. So that so that winds up in terms of, and uh, when when I heard Jonathan died, I cried. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I was uh, very. Yeah. I of course, and when, when when I saw him in the Dark Shadows movie, uh, it was just such a he's such a. Sh People didn't remember. I I went to that to the theater, and I think I was the only one that clapped when I saw Aww. him and Laura and Catherine Lee Scott and David Selby. I was the only one that clapped. No, it just it was like it was like two seconds. But Jonathan it was such a had, brief brief cameo, you know. But I know he was you know and he was poor, ill. He was ill at that point. point yeah. He was ill at that point. But he left he he left his mark and he made a difference. Yeah. And even though he may not have. Uh, you know, and he and he came we, to terms with the role. Yeah. He did come to terms yeah. with it.
And we should, yes, he did. And he did appear at many, he'd go through stretches where he wouldn't, but then he yes. he would, he, he appreciated the fact that he had fans who were, adored him, who like really were thrilled by him. So he, yes, he, he, he certainly appreciated that. And we should also add that his first love was the theater and he loved doing those one man shows. And that was his favorite thing, doing those one man shows. Yes, he and did. and yes, then his did. website, jonathanfrit.com, where he would post monologues and, and yeah, yeah, thoughts yes. that he had. He did, I remember going, I used used to love going to his website and just listening to the clips and seeing his posts and he had a a Q&A board and he'd post yes, updates indeed. and uh he yes, he indeed. he really did some he was doing the thing he loved and that's wonderful um now we should move on here because yes, the, the Jonathan absolutely. Fred as much as of course we love Jonathan Fred he's not the only actor we love we love of course we, we, <laughs> don't we appreciate anybody. don't tell anybody don't tell anybody <laughs> <laughs> the Jonathan Fritz fans are going to be running after yeah, you now. Yeah. Uh, we we appreciate all of the actors from from Dark Shadows this and the true. crew and everybody who created the the show that we we are fans of. But today we're going to talk about Thayer David, another actor on Dark Shadows who is beloved by fans for his portrayals of many characters on the show. He's one of the most respected and talented actors in Dark Shadows. Uh, He played the highest number of characters any actor in the series played. He also appeared in both House and Night of Dark Shadows. Thayer had an extraordinary career, uh, which was sadly cut short by his passing at the age of 51 uh, in 1978. So uh, it's Mm-hmm. Really is Tom because he never really, unlike many of the other other actors like like Jonathan Fred who we were talking about, he never really got to fully experience the just adulation and that fans have for the show and for the characters and actors and performances in the show. He probably maybe got a taste of that when it was went into syndication, but he'd never got to really experience the you know the conventions and the yeah, publicity and all that, that from from subsequent years. Uh, he was born in my home state here of Massachusetts uh, and was Medford. Medford. Medford, yeah, Medford, Massachusetts, yeah. So he co-founded the Brattle Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts. He went on to perform on stage in many roles, including The Taming of the Shrew, King Lear, Uncle Vanya, and many more. He appeared on television in many roles outside of his role in, uh, his roles on Dark Shadows, roles in the Wild Wild West. Yep. The Amazing Spider-Man, yep. Charlie's Angels, and lots more. He appeared in many films, playing the likes of the villainous Count Sacknesson in Journey to the Center of the Earth. Yes. A great part. He was so bad and now you said he's a, he was a great villain in, in that film the fight promoter miles Jurgens and rocky reverend silas pendrake and little big man and charlie robbins and save the tiger which also starred his ds castmate laura parker were you going to say something tom were you going to just, uh, i i was just gonna uh, i was just gonna say that i think that his role in rocky was probably the most famous one yes uh, yeah of, of his and i remember i never expected i i remember seeing rocky for the first time i had no idea that he was an eric and he comes on and I said, man, he made it. That was yeah. really, really, that was, re- that was really nice. And of course, Nero Wolf, which yeah. uh, yes. had that, had, had that taken off. I think that he was really on the way back. Uh, he was a solid character actor. Mm-hmm. Uh, and is, and, and you mentioned uh, a, a few of his, uh, a few of his things and uh, his, uh, his real, and his real name is David Thayer. Percy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it, 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 he just juxtaposed the name around. Um, and, uh, and his father was an executive in the paper pulp industry. And, uh, and, and, and Thayer attended Harvard in the 40s, but he didn't graduate. However, I think that as part of his Stokes character, he's, he's, he's wearing something. And I don't remember whether it's the monocles or, or a ring or something like that, but he wears something that is, that his father had given him. Uh, and, and because his father had hoped that he would graduate Harvard. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and so he's wearing, and probably one of your fans will get to you tell saying what that article was, but I did come across it and, and it might've been the monocle. I'm not sure, but, uh, but he did wear something, a personal, jewelry item of his and that went back to the harvard days and he wore that as as, uh, professor stokes yeah he was uh he was an integral part of the design uh and costuming for his characters when he was on the on dark shadows out of the actors in dark shadows i think he was you know talking with uh vinny lascalzo and edith tillies and trying and he would come up with ideas for his character he was a part of that 
process. Uh, makes sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, the actors on Dark Shadows referred to him as a walking encyclopedia. Uh, He was highly educated, well-read. He took great interest in helping to develop the personalities and ideas for his characters, which we'll we'll touch on as as we go through that. But I I like Mm -hmm. that you mentioned, you know, you're watching Rocky and there's Thayer David, because it was the same. He would show up in these movies because I was... uh, I remember hosting on my on my show uh, the Werewolf of Washington, uh, a werewolf <laughs> movie. Yeah, with Dean Stockwell. He's yeah, Dean Stockwell yeah, yeah. werewolf yeah. movie. Yeah, and all of a sudden there's Thayer David. I see, he's like an inspector or something. I said, "What is Thayer David doing? He can't get away from the werewolves. He's going back to the to the spooky world here, doing doing the werewolves." But yeah, he's uh, you see him in a lot of stuff. And as you mentioned, Nero Wolf. Sadly, um, you know that was a pilot for That's for, right. for a TV show, That's right. and uh, and uh, they put it ABC put it on the shelf for a while, and then. They you eventually it. aired it, you know, say it was uh, what, what, over a year, like a year and a half or something after yep. David died. Yep. Yep. They uh, they aired that. And so uh, it's too bad because I think you're right. I do think that would have, uh, you know, playing that that detective character, definitely something I he would have been well, great so- at. You know. He was he he was married to actress Valerie French for five years from seventy to seventy five divorce, but they were on the way to getting back together, mm-hmm. from way I from what I yeah. understand. Yeah. And uh, and 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 Thayer uh, Thayer of course uh, had uh, had weight challenges, and yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I was told that he used to come his diet when he'd show up at the studios, uh, he'd be on uh, Coca Cola and chocolate bars. Yeah. And that's what he'd bring, and he gobble them up like crazy you can bring yeah. uh, you bring oodles and oodles of chocolate bars yeah and uh and, and that certainly didn't help and uh and, and so uh you know the uh and he and he passed in, in he passed in new york city and uh, he he was cremated but they were planning to remarry and uh and, and i think that would have happened uh yeah. had he not had an untimely death I, yeah i, I but, wish he ma- but he made his mark he, he definitely it. did i hope that he at least got to catch the beginnings of the sort of the fandom developing uh, around Dark Shadows or, I mean, during the run of the show, certainly experienced that leave, coming in and out of the studio and the, the kids all being outside and, and cheering them on and wanting their autographs and stuff. But then the longevity of the show, I wish he had gotten to experience that. He did, a, he did do an interview at around that, time. I think it was on the on Ron, the Ron Barry show. I think uh, years ago, uh, that was from that from that era, like sixty eight. But uh, the reason I wanted, you know, the reason I wanted to talk about Thayer David today with you is I've heard you on the Literary License podcast mention frequently what a big fan of of Thayer David's you are, and that he sometimes mm-hmm. maybe doesn't get as much recognition as uh, some of the other people involved with the show in terms of his characters and stuff. So, what is it about Thayer David that you find so compelling? Uh, the acting range that he had, uh, he was, uh, of course, you know, in his, and, and his first role on the show of uh, with Matthew Morgan, yeah. uh, who, uh, and, and he was actually, that was actually the second actor who played the Matthew Morgan yeah. role. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was the first one again? I think George, George that, Mitchell. George, George Mitchell. Yes. Mitchell. And, yeah. and George Mitchell. Mitchell. And uh, I, I think one thing that Thayer did was to try and actually give accents to uh, his characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very few Dark Shadows characters, unfortunately, had New England accents. (laughs) Uh, George Mitchell was one. Uh, and um, uh, the guy, uh, Bill Malo- the Bill Malloy character. Oh, yeah, Frank thing. Schofield. Yeah, Frank right. Schofield. Uh, yeah. And who knows? Oh, God, uh, th- th- that's the big mystery. Where Whatever happened to Frank Schofield? That's a big mystery. In the he film. was, uh, he did a, he did some, you know, a bunch of stuff after Dark Shadows, but I wish yes. they had, I was talking with Jeff about him, Jeff Thompson, we was on here and we were expressing how we wished he had come back. Like, I thought it would have been cool to see a living parallel time version of like Bill Malloy didn't die in parallel uh, time and he's still well, around. I think well, that would and then you bring him back i think that would have i mean if they brought back mr wells the innkeeper uh you know to get the spoilers yeah, killed to get by the killed, killed by the werewolf they can yeah, bring back yeah. bill Conrad Malloy. Conrad Bain. Conrad major Bain. conrad bain yeah, conrad bain. Bain. yeah absolutely so, yeah and that was i think yeah the uh no i i i i definitely agree with you that and mm-hmm. that was a whole um he there was there was talk that there was talk that you know that he really, he, the Frank Schofield wanted to stay, uh, and uh, 
but it, because he really didn't want to go back to doing regional work after that. He felt mm -hmm. that Dark Shadows was a good gig. Mm -hmm. uh, but but anyway, getting back to Thayer David, so so he took over this role, but of course, now George Mitchell established the uh, New England accent and Thayer David uh, continued that. And of course, you know, that was, uh, that was some, uh, that character was extremely loyal to Liz. And uh, there was talk of a brother, Walter, who lived in cold water. And Matthew Morgan committed his first murder when he was 10 and he killed his old family dog. So Ma Matthew worked for Elizabeth's father, who would have been Jameson, so, since we're mm -hmm. talking about uh, what, what we yeah. later knew from the 1897 segment. And in 1949, Elizabeth uh, hired him on as a handyman. She got uh, rid of everybody else, all the other I, I mean, people. She kept him. Kept, kept him around. Yeah. Kept him. I gave him his own cottage. So in now, it doesn't say the year, but around the year after he got hired, he got into an accident on the hill leading down from Collinwood. Mm -hmm. And his car went over the side of the, of the road and he was nearly killed because of bad brakes. Mm -hmm. So at that point, he yeah. wanted all the brakes to be maintained. Uh, and of course, then there's the whole plot in the first year uh, when Roger's car was sabotaged. He went, a, a, a Matthew mm -hmm. Went along with Elizabeth's suggestion he take the blame himself. Matthew also liked to bake muffins. So for the Matthew Morgan, yes, yes, he did. For the Matthew Morgan uh, fans, he's, yes. a muffin, he's a muffin he's, baker. He he, beca he becomes an unhinged murderer, but he <laughs> likes to bake muffins. So <laughs> and, he, and, it, and he drove the station wagon while he was. Yep. I don't. Know, I hope he wasn't baking muffins while he was driving. <laughs> Um, and now he killed Bill Malloy, and, yeah. and that's part of the major plot. Pushed, accidentally pushed him off the cliff. Yeah, yep. And then, but then Nikki he becomes, found, yeah, he becomes you know, like a like a frightened animal after that. He becomes unhinged, completely absolutely. unhinged after absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. And then when Vicky found out he was responsible for the murder, he held her hostage in the room. But he, he also he also tried to kill her. I remember all those old beautiful old scenes with which they filmed out in Seaview yes, yes. in black and white, where he tried where he where she's walking along the house and he tries to, and, and he's on, and he's, and he tries to push a, a big stone vase on, onto yeah, her and yeah. hit her over the head. And I remember that. Bill, so David, David brought food and supplies to him and so forth while he was hiding, while he was hiding Vicky mm -hmm. hostage. And, of course, and then he finally met his death with, by the ghosts of the, of the widows and of course, Bill Malloy. And they brought back Frank Schofield for a yeah. couple of ghost appearances yeah. uh, before he tried to kill Vicky with an axe sure. and he was read Vicky was rescued by Roger and Burke and uh and and it was said that he that he had a heart attack yeah. so that was the end of uh yeah. of uh, Matthew Morgan and, and and I will add that these episodes with Matthew Morgan were not available in syndication so right. these were not seen until the 90s until a, a sci-fi channel and MPI home video came around and started airing Dark Shadows. So I remember when I first watched, I was watching the syndicated Dark Shadows episodes and which of course started with Barnabas. And when they got to 1795, when Vic, Vicky Winters sees Ben, she's, she freaks out and she calls him Matthew Morgan. She's, Matthew Morgan, stay away from me. And I remember when I was a kid watching and I said, who's Matthew Morgan? Why is she scared? So I realized there must've been some other person you know another character that vicky knew maybe from before that looked like ben but i didn't know who matthew morgan was until of course you know my scrapbook memories of dark shadows came out and i could read the summary from the beginning to the end i said oh there was a character matthew morgan who was played by thayer david and looks like ben stokes uh but he's like the evil version of ben you know or or not i think well, he became unstable, completely unstable. He was loyal to a to a fault and not the brightest, uh, you know, bulb on the tree. So he he accidentally kills Bill Malloy, who was also loyal to Liz and was trying to protect Liz as well. So uh, and then became like a frightened animal and unhinged as yes. he, the walls were closing in on him and and you know takes our our lead. You character. always see a latent a latent paranoid murderer because you know he would th i think he threatened burke yeah. yes uh, at, uh, you know at one point and he just you know yes, and, uh, did, yeah. and anybody and uh, and was it will uh, willie also i'm not sure no 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 this was before willie yeah uh but but he I, uh but 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 he was definitely he was loyal to to liz to a fault i will now, say can you imagine i'm uh, just yeah. a question like we mentioned george mm -hmm. mitchell who did play uh matthew morgan for three episodes and did the you know new england accent too and then thayer came in who actually is was from new England from Massachusetts right. but I 
I have a difficult time imagining George Mitchell playing that version of Matthew Morgan that we saw Thayer David evolve into. I agree into. with you. I can't, because he didn't have, Thayer David is almost otherworldly himself in his, he's very eccentric and, and physically imposing as well, you know, and I can't yeah. really yeah. imagine George Mitchell doing that. And of course he originally was, I, it was Roger uh, who was going to be the, the killer. They were going to kill Roger off and, you know, Louis Edmonds was so much fun to watch as as well, Roger. I'm sure they changed talking, their minds. Well, you're you talking know? there about the original intent of Shadows yeah. on the Wall. Yeah, right, which right. Was uh, the Art Wallace uh, yes uh, yeah. adaptation, and uh, yeah, the, the, sure. And it was, and for a while, Louis Edmonds was was his job was he was kind of wondering what they're going to do with him and they <laughs> continue to follow that and luck yeah. and thank goodness they decided sure, yeah. to, keep, to keep him around and, but i i'm and glad the thayer the came in i can't imagine george mitchell i liked george mitchell as as matthew morgan i thought he was good as that sort of main you know grizzled old main guy who lives in in the cabin and is mm -hmm. not very friendly and mm -hmm. uh but mm -hmm. and very protective of, mm -hmm. but he i mm -hmm. can't imagine him being insane like matthew morgan became you know exactly well also matthew uh thayer david had the physical presence that yes. george, that, that that george mitchell did not george he was short. george mitchell was thought short and he was thin matthew yeah. morgan i mean uh thayer david uh was twice his size yeah and 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 if you look at the next character which was ben yes Stewart, yeah uh, that's really a uh a sedgway but in my opinion between matthew morgan and ben mm -hmm. uh because they are uh, you know, they they not only looked alike. When Vicky first went to 1795 and encountered Ben, she she thought she was looking at Matthew Morgan. Yeah, and she actually said, "Oh my God, it's Matthew Morgan." Now, for those fans that didn't know who Matthew Morgan was, I know there was an attempt to connect the two. For those fans that didn't know who Matthew Morgan was, they would have been left like, "What? What?" But but I could understand why they did that because as most of the 1795 characters uh, were, ex actually, they were the actor, the same actors. So the attempt was made to show that they were physically, uh, they physically looked exactly like their counterparts. Mm -hmm. So Ben Stokes was Matthew Morgan's counterpart. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and Ben is one of my favorite characters. Oh, everybody loves Ben. And, you know, Mr. Yeah. Barnabas, what are you doing, Mr. Barnabas? <laughs> Don't do it, sir. You always do your your Ben at the start of the Literary License podcast. Story, <laughs> Story of blood relations. Story of blood relations, literally. Uh, <laughs> I also Keith has some. Um, Keith uh, Chalgo is the uh, is the is the is the. Uh, head honcho and and he has a couple of my voiceovers that he's never used like bernie sanders who do <laughs> <laughs> watch start shadows <laughs> somebody did that with uh, i think it was the collins Port historical society actually with uh with bernie Sa you know the famous picture of bernie sanders with the mittens sitting at the inauguration and he's asking yes, the mascot. Yes, yes, they yes, put yes, him yes. in the in the collin wood in the uh, drawing room with the rest of the cast sitting in that chair <laughs> i was like oh, oh not with the rest it was like, like judith and quentin or something in the background and there's Bernie sitting in the in the chair. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but 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 seriously, the the manservant of of yeah. Barnabas, uh, who was really uh, again, he is devoted to yes. Barnabas as Matthew Morgan was to Liz. I was going to say the same exactly. Yeah, he is loyal just like Matthew Morgan was. But in a, it's an interesting counterpoint, you know, it's, definitely it, it, exactly. And and the and the and the real the the Matthew Morgan character was basically more of a gothic a gothic romance but it was, but there was no supernatural element mixed yeah. in yeah and he was but a villain ben, yeah exactly but uh, that's correct and he was the villain but and ben also had the uh, had the had the jail background now yes ben yeah. uh, now the character of ben was born they they're now according to the fandom he was born in 1756 this is fandom wiki you're getting this from, this right? is fandom wiki this is yeah. fandom wiki so i do want to get the dark shadows him. fandom wiki yep and and, I, and it's a very good and it's a very good uh, site. And it I is a very it is a good resource. Uh, I I think it's an excellent resource, and uh, and anybody can add to it as 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 a fan. But sometimes I find things in there, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, this is, where is this coming? From? Or or the big finish stuff is merged with the show stuff, and I feel there should be exactly. a, a distinction and, and the, because it's like that's canonical for the big finish, but you shouldn't merge it with the show stuff because then it muddies. You're like confused, like it muddies the water. It's like was this in the show or wasn't this in the show? So I think there should. 
should be this, but I really appreciate the fact that that exists and it's a, a sensational resource for, for anybody. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So according to that, so he was born in 1756, he fought in the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, then he was arrested because he was breaking into somebody's house and he was in prison for a long time. Yeah. And uh, now, I, as I recall from the show, Joshua took him out of prison. Yeah, indentured uh, servitude, yep. Exactly. And it was a, more of an indentured servant. And, uh, you know, and, and Joshua never really liked the guy. Yeah. Uh, but Barnabas, uh, but Barnabas, of course, and he got along. And then, of course, Angelique places mm -hmm. Ben under her spell. And uh, Ben hated Angelique, you know, so he was so there was that uh, there was that tense setup sure. uh, in terms of should he obey Angelique or should he obey Barnabas, uh, which was a, which was which were great plot devices. Mm -hmm. um, and then of, and then, of course, when Angelique was killed by Barnabas after he became a vampire, Ben became uh, his servant truly. And, and then there's a whole there's a whole plot uh, which I suggest all the new fans look at uh but thayer david uh and of course ben wrote uh, the true history of the family pertaining to barnabas after barnabas was sealed in the mausoleum uh which was in conflict to what to joshua wrote and that uh, which became the collins family history but, but the bottom line was is that ben was given his freedom by mm -hmm. uh joshua and barnabas had wanted that mm -hmm. Ben was given a hundred dollars in the small parts of the land and then ben reappears much later, well, we go back to 1795 uh, at one point, and we have a whole reprise of the uh, of the Ben Stokes role, yeah. uh, and then, but then in the 1840 segment, uh, much later, he is the grandfather of Carrie Stokes, who was, uh, and, and that of course is the 1840 with the Gerard, uh, the Gerard Styles. Sure, part. yeah. And we see course, old Ben, which is really cool. Like he must have come back to Collinwood at some point. You know, he was given his freedom, but he must have either chosen to stay or maybe Daniel asked him to return. You know, Ben returns to Collinwood. Ben uh, lives in Collinwood. He's, yeah. he's they, he, the, the the makeup. I mean, the poor the poor Thayer <laughs> David. He looked like yeah. he looked like he had a cheek. He had an extra cheek falling. Yeah, off. there was there was some. Yeah, I don't know if was Vinny off the. Sh I know Vinny left for a while. Loscalzo, the makeup man, who was mm -hmm. really talented. Vinny, mm -hmm. I think he did because I noticed he, his name isn't in the credits for like a long stretch around that time, and then he comes back. Uh, you see, you start seeing his name again. So I don't know if he had uh, apprentices or something working uh, uh, under him, or if probably, he probably left to go do probably. something else and then came back, possibly. You know, so I mean, it was because his, Vin, Vinny's old age makeup for for well, Dick Smith did Barnabas, but for for right. Angelique when uh, Cassandra when she ages looks really awesome i mean it was really good old age makeup yeah. and then even in 1995 when we saw professor old professor stokes and old uh mrs johnson uh the makeup is pretty good you know but the ben makeup in 1840 i'm not saying it's bad it's just strange looking i guess you know a little the, the cheek area is like eh, could have used a little work there but it's he was it was wonderful to see ben back again like that's such a cool idea to bring back ben i know it contradicts what it said on his gravestone you know we've talked about the time travel conundrums and dark shadows before there's been so 1860, much 1860 actually it was, yeah. it was it was in the 1897 flashback yeah ben's grave was seen in the 1816 but yeah. he died in 1840 that was uh and it's kind of kind of sad to see ben finally die uh, i didn't like the way that he died i was so sad because spoilers again i mean i always say spoilers these days but the show is you know over 50 years old if you haven't watched it by now you know you don't want to better. know how ben dies you better, you better fast forward fast yeah fast you don't want to know but he tries to, to to cut his own head off because you know judah zachary forces him to, to try to cut his own head off, which is a really gruesome way to kill off. I wish Ben had a more dignified death than that I because agree. he's such a beloved character. What a, what, a, what a hell of a way to get rid of him. Yeah. Poor Ben. Was, it's like, oh God. Because Ben was in 1795, you know, we say you know, he was Barnabas' servant, but he wasn't. Barnabas didn't bite him. He he was helping Barnabas because he was his friend in life. Barnabas helped, taught him to read and write, and he cared about Barnabas, yeah, but he times. was his conscience. He served as his conscience because Barnabas was wanted to do horrible things, and he was going to kill people, and Ben would tell him, please, no, don't do this thing. You know, he would try to kind of reason with Barnabas, which was a really great function that he served in the, in the story to help 
Barnabas kind of, he was desperate for Barnabas to hold Grounded on to it. some shred of humanity that he, you know, to, to not be a, a, a killer, yeah. which he was. Yeah. Barnabas was a predator at that point. He was a vampire, you know? So Ben was trying That's to right. kind of anchor him to don't, don't do this, you know, think of your family. Yeah. And then of course he's put upon by Joshua early in the storyline and then goes from the frying pan into the fire with Angelique, who's mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. witch and is basically, you know, she did, tells him if you don't do what i say here's what's going to happen and she makes his heart beat harder and harder until it's going to burst you know things horrible things so right. he goes from being put upon to put upon even more and but then him and Joshua, him mute and he was struck mute yeah and, every time he uh, said her he couldn't say her name or you know right, and then right. him and joshua by the end of the story share this bond of grief of uh, over what they've That's gone right. through you know right. which is interesting because they start out in one place where they're Ben hates Joshua. He, you know, when Angelique turns him into a cat, Ben wants to kid, kill him with the axe and, you know, uh, <laughs> chase, chase, chasing him with the I axe. Remember, yeah. And that was very funny about, yeah. yeah about Which ben another call back to Matthew Morgan like to, with the axe too, right? You know? Like to take the cat and put him in a bag or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, exactly. You know, they don't like each other, but by the end, they've been through this ordeal and in extreme tragedy and there's there is a, a almost a mutual respect that takes place there by the end which i really like i love that you know sam hall and gordon russell and i think ron sprout was was there yes he was john ron sprout too at that point they really made you care about the you know these characters and exactly that and dynamic that's one of the reasons why it, why it lasted and why it kept up yep. and so then after so then after ben we go back to the present and now yeah. his descendant oh, professor yeah. timothy elliott stokes <laughs> yes <you know? laughs> great I character wonderful that, i believe that we are coming now to the point where <laughs> in, interesting <laughs> enough in my lecture we <laughs> well anyway um, <laughs> um that was uh, and 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 I, I think that and of course Thayer David and and that uh, that establishes a very very interesting dynamic, where uh, whereas Ben was the illiterate servant that Barnabas yes. taught mm -hmm. to read and write, and uh, and after a while Ben was able to do a pretty decent job with that, uh, lived modestly but was comfortable for the rest of his life. Uh, now Timothy Elliott Stokes is now the professor, mm -hmm. and uh, he uh, lives in an apartment on Arrowhead Road in Collinsport. He was a he was a he was a he was a he was a, he was a fan of the occult and uh, expert well, expert uh, expert <laughs> expert. So he was really a professor of the occult, so to speak. Yeah. We never knew what he taught, but uh, we knew that. The occult was certainly part of his repertoire, mm -hmm. and uh, he was uh, exorcism, seances, and of course the I Ching. And um, it, it's uh, and 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 here Thayer David really shows his acting range yeah. because before, as as Ben, he's obvious, you know, he's he was the uneducated uh, part. Now here he's the super educated, cynical bachelor. Uh, so to speak, uh, you know, where where Ben, uh, I guess Ben married, uh, you know, in, yeah. in terms of at some point because Carrie is or Carrie yeah, exists, you know, Carrie's a granddaughter, unless he adopted her, but it's it possible. Like no, it. no, yeah. I believe he's a granddaughter. So, but Ben, but uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. So Professor Stokes is uh, is is an old, a little bit of an old curmudgeon of a bachelor, mm -hmm. but uh, and uh, and <laughs> Barnabas kind of keeps him on the on the fence a lot, which uh, Stokes. Yeah kind of represents. Stokes also takes on uh, an added role as being Adam's teacher, yeah. uh, and Robert Rodan's Adam, yeah. uh, and that's when they were doing the Frankenstein uh, mm -hmm. ripoff. And, uh, and, and there's homage, some, homage. Homage, homage. <laughs> well, it, it, I guess it depends on your point of view. Uh, but no, no, it's an homage to, it's an homage to uh, Frankenstein, the Bride of Frankenstein. Yes, yeah. Um, but, uh, but I think here, what I think here is very interesting is the, the a number of scenes between Robert Rodan and who just passed away. Yeah, uh, sadly. Uh, May yeah. rest in peace. We lost so many of the Dark Shadows uh, actors this past year. It's so oh, sad. Yeah. Oh, no, it's, yeah. ter it's terrible. But anyway, so there were a lot of interesting scenes where Professor Stokes is now in the role of the father. Uh, well, Barnabas is the father, but Professor Stokes is the role of the homeschool teacher. And <laughs> what he did for home 
homeschool, I'll tell you, uh, I, I mentioned in the last episode, homeschooling uh, got a big, uh, got a big public relations um, <laughs> a, a, a boost as a result of Professor Stokes's tutoring of Adam. Better, much better uh, teacher than Nicholas Blair was, that's for sure. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and yeah. that's a great, also another great dynamic, Nicholas versus, uh, Nicholas versus uh, Professor so Stokes. Or Stokes terms. versus Angelique in the dream, entering the dream curse. Oh, like, that was great, oh yeah. yeah fantastic, yeah, yeah that oh, cemented yeah. Professor well, Stokes as like, breaks this, all the rules. this guy is awesome as soon as he did that he went face to face with angelique of all characters it's like wow this guy is you this know he's is, one he, knew, he, he knows what he's doing he's he a knows tough exactly what he's gonna yeah. do as well as what he's doing and he yeah. broke all the rules yeah and and and, and he really flummoxed angelique yeah. and yeah. she and she was like you know and and she she did whatever she could with him. that's part of the reasons probably why nicholas came on to the sure. scene because he was he was annoyed already she wasn't doing the job yeah. so the boss now comes on the scene but um it was it was certainly a tribute to thayer to thayer david to uh, as i said showing the range mm -hmm. uh of the two of the two actors sure. uh remember uh, also he brought Janet Findlay to Collinwood, and she yeah. was a medium who investigated, uh, and that led to Quentin Collins. And uh, and then, of course, we have uh, 1995 Stokes, yeah. and they go into the future for that yeah. brief period of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, and, then, and they're already poor Professor Stokes is a sad uh, is is a sad uh, remnant yeah. of the vital stokes that we saw but that was as a result of all the uh, stuff with gerard and i think uh, that served to make it seem that much more apocalyptic because stokes mm -hmm. was such an instrumental character in terms of his he's the guy they called on when it came to the issues supernatural battling the supernatural and he even stokes was frightened it set up this intensely terrifying scenario you know what the hell happened here you know even stokes is cowed by this you know and he you know he has the he's old man with the hearing aid and dressed in his his black suit and he was he was great at, at playing the old stokes just you know as we saw him later play the, old, as we ben. Saw the old ben uh, yeah. so it's so yeah. it's interesting to hear that yeah. he portrayed old versions of two yeah. of the of the stokes characters one one thing we forgot to mention too with ben with the old ben jumping back briefly uh one thing that i thought was really cool too is when you know if julia goes back in time to 1840 and she gets there before barnabas does and right. she meets ben so it was kind of like oh this is so cool like julia and ben are teaming oh, yes. up you know oh, that absolutely. was really fun to watch absolutely. because they're meeting each other you know it's because they're from two different eras but it's was that was really cool but i'm sorry to interrupt that well, no, any, not uh, at all. Stoke, i have some thoughts on stokes here as well but do you have any more thoughts on professor stokes that that's basically it yeah. of course you know please jump in whenever you yeah. i mean your, your knowledge is your knowledge is really uh is really prodigious and uh you know and of course that, that of course enlivens the conversation so um and, and now uh of well, course we also get into the well remember now the timothy stokes well, well i'm gonna before we go to timothy stokes i have some thoughts on professor stokes here because oh sure um i love professor stokes i think he is probably uh, it's a tie for me as for as far as favorite character. It's hard to pick a favorite as it, as you can see what we're talking about here. It's very difficult to pick a favorite there David character because they're so well they're such well formed characters. Professor Stokes, in many ways, he's the opposite of Ben because he's highly right. educated, right. highly intelligent, but he also has a good heart like Ben. You know, he is a, he's one of the good guys. You know, he tries to to help protect people. He is very much cut from the same cloth, and I'm sure this it was an inspiration for the character, Professor Abraham Van Helsing in uh, mm -hmm. in Dracula, mm -hmm. uh, in the sense that Van Helsing is the wise occult expert he knows a lot about he's a person of of, of science and he's an educated man rather right. you know but he's also very knowledgeable about the occult and he is the guy you go to when you don't know when you're battling something that you're out of your depth and you're battling some supernatural force this is the character who knows what that is and knows has information about it he is the wise scholar the wise expert in the occult definitely 
from that lineage of Professor Abraham Van Helsing. And we saw this type of character earlier in the Laura storyline with Guthrie, Dr. Guthrie. And then to some extent, Julia, when she initially comes in, she has that going on as well. She was intended as sort of the Van Helsing character. Uh, now, now here's worth, the thing, though. Yeah. Here's the thing. And I'm thinking yeah. of uh, Robert, uh, uh, Dr. Woodard, Robert Geringer's Dr. He, Woodard. He was a more of a, like the Dr. Seward, I believe. You know, Dr. Seward okay. bringing okay. in the Van Helsing. That was sort of okay. how I saw okay. him. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 that is interesting to us, yeah, mm-hmm. to a certain extent. And I, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think that, uh, and again, remember that all of this, and mm-hmm. by the way, uh, Dark Shadows Wiki talks, and, and again, and they are, I think, draw, drawing mm-hmm. on the uh, Big Finish audio appearances. And in the Big Finish stuff, uh, Stokes has a brother, Silas, and a sister, June. Oh. So, yeah. so, you know, so, okay. so, so, the, yeah. so there you go. Yeah. But, I, but, I, but I think okay. that in terms of, we're all, basically, this, is, this just speaks to the range and the believability that Thayer David was able yeah. to bring. But we have the core, we have Barnabas. Barnabas is our main character and we have Julia, but they never, Eric and I talked about this in episode two. Somebody like Stokes can't really, even though he's an occult expert and he can help battle supernatural forces, they can't fully confide in him. They can't bring, and this is the yes. case with the family too, because he's too much of a of a good person to be okay with what the, start out as villains and become there's the anti heroes of the that, show. They yeah. murder people. They've murdered Barnabas has murdered people, uh, and Julia has been an accomplice in that. There are right. things right. they can't talk about. Stokes, I don't think, would be ever be okay with with that. So there's only right. so far they can they bring him in to help, and he's a fantastic character, but he well, can't fully. The, the, there's a difference between the him and Ben because whereas mm-hmm. Ben was totally into and knew of the entire uh, the entire history of Barnabas's secret, Professor Stokes didn't, and or so we fact, think. <laughs> so maybe well, he figured well, he it out suspicion. and never said anything. Yeah, he had suspicions, yeah. and and he got very close to the truth at, at various times. But also there is this there is this sense that you get during uh during the during the adam episodes that stokes is really saying to to julia you know i'm going to be out for myself if you if you're not Mm -hmm. more yeah uh, so 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 professor stokes is opening his mouth and saying i'm not going to be taken advantage of and i'm not going to be used yeah that is that is what was going on they weren't ever willing to fully let him in uh, on on the inner circle with that with what was going on because he wouldn't have been cool with it i don't think he would have been okay with with some of what was going on understandably you know uh and that would open up a whole other can of worms in terms that of is what, a difference what he would between find him and ben that is a difference yeah. between yes. him and ben because yeah. ben was totally loyal stokes yeah. was not loyal at all stokes was stokes wanted to do the right thing but but stokes realized that they were keeping they were keeping things from him and he didn't like it and and, and because he was bright enough and because he was a, because he was a scholar and because he was you know uh it was it, it, it really was an insult to his intelligence yeah. and and it comes across but again Thayer david is very effective in yeah. terms of making that come across in the portrayal yeah and many fans speculate that he f- did figure out Barnabas had been maybe wait this is not in the show but that he came close to the truth maybe because he's so smart you know it's like and he's he's an expert in the in the occult maybe he did figure out Barnabas was a vampire at one point but saw that he was walking around in the daylight and this maybe that he knew that he was no longer a vampire at that point and kind of kept it to himself but we don't see any hint of that in 1995 either like he's not sure where Barnabas went during the day so maybe not but anyway let's move on to the next character we, here I do I say one more thing though in Go the Dark it. Shadows yeah. movie in the House of yeah. Dark Shadows movie yeah that Professor Stokes does find out oh yes uh, and fully embraces the Van Helsing uh <laughs> becomes the vampire hunter of the of the movie yeah exactly definitely. exactly yeah. but then becomes a vampire himself yes and yeah what a twist time yeah <laughs> you ever saw professor stokes as a vampire attacking jeff yeah. and uh roger davis told me the story of uh, uh you know of them fighting in the water and this was not there david's cup of tea was swimming 
Uh, so there was a little, they had to, they had to uh, work around that uh, mm -hmm. to a certain extent, but I did want to point out that there is that one other portrayal, and of course in Reverend Strack in yes, Night sure. of Dark Shadows movie. Yeah, yeah. So those are two other portrayals uh, where, uh, you know, and that, and Reverend Strack, the yeah. Reverend Strack is really more of a takeoff on Trask. Yeah. In fact, I think that might have actually been an anagram of Trask. Yes, yeah, yeah. An anagram yeah. of Trask. Yeah, so, Ansel and I were, were talking about that in the in the yeah, most recent so, episode. Yeah, yeah. So that yeah, yeah, yeah. So but again, more more credit to Thayer David. Sure. So so, so Sandor so, is next, right? Let's talk Sandor. about Sandor. Let's yeah. talk about Sandor. Sandor Rakosi. To... One other quick thing about Professor Stokes. His name is Timothy Stokes when we first meet him, and then it's Timothy Elliot Stokes, and then they just right. start calling him Elliot, <laughs> which they're calling him by his middle name, basically. They call him Elliot, but it's still T Elliot Stokes. Maybe at some right. point he said, I prefer to be called Elliot problem solved because i've seen some debate about that it's like and the reason for that is from what i understand is they are david as we said was heavily involved in the in the creation of his characters so he was a big fan of the poet t.s Eliot. and if you uh, switch the letters around you know take the s from stokes t.s.e t.s Eliot. yeah and he wanted great. he wanted the Eliot as part of the name as i understand so it that's became great. it became like part of his name that's that's as from from what i understand that's how it kind of came about but anyway let's that's move right. on Let's move on. Sandor. To, yeah. Okay. So, 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 and, and this of course is another extension and this is where they got to give him a suntan uh, <laughs> and uh, gave him and, and gave him that old, that dark brunette hair uh, with mm -hmm. the, with the mustache. And of course that's in the 1897 uh, segment, mm -hmm. uh, Sandor, who is married to Magda. Magda Rikosi, and yeah. that's played by Grayson right. Hall. One yeah. of, and uh, the Grayson Hall fandom feels that uh, there's a there's a big Magda contingent, and some of them are saying that that might be even a little better than Julia. I love uh, Magda. That was Grayson's favorite role too, actually. Yes, it was. Yeah, yes, yeah. it was. And of course, Grayson Hall came from a an, a Russian Lithuanian kind of background, yeah. and uh, so there was some gypsy in the grandmother's she was, side. So she was very proud of her Magyar you know, heritage. Yeah. Very far, very proud of that. So, uh, and anyway. there, however, was I don't believe was so that would certainly be a, a problematic portrayal, probably by you know, in, on modern television. But when you have a, a werewolf story, of course, we go back to the Wolfman, there, there's that gypsy component is always there. And I know they've had a blast playing those roles, but probably nowadays, you know, you wouldn't see they would hire Romani people to play play the roles, mm -hmm. surely. But uh, at the time, you know, this is well, the interesting thing is, is that. And of course, you mentioned the gypsy. So if you look upon the wolfman, Maria Auschwitzkaya, yeah. uh, who, who did she the gypsy great. there. But here, Magda's gypsy is the one that curses Quentin. Yes. Where yeah. in the werewolf, in the in the wolfman, it was uh, Lugosi. Bites uh, him, yeah. It was the son of the gypsy yeah. that, that that did this to that did this to Lon Chaney's Larry Talbot. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so but 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 again, Magda's sister Jenny was married to Quentin, and that's why Magda came to Collinwood in the first place. Sandor opened Barnabas Collins' coffin in 1897, and and they and it's kind of a it's kind of a again they're borrowing from Willie. So now Sandor is looking for the Collins family jewels yeah. when he comes upon, uh, whereas Willie was looking for that in the uh, you know. So again that so that's they kind of uh, again that was kind of borrowing. So Sandor was eventually knifed and killed by other gypsies. And then uh, he was, Sandor was raised from the dead by Johnny Romano uh, to testify to Magda's innocence. And Sandor was tricked into betraying her. He, she was sentenced to death. And then Magda sent Sandor back to the grave. But of course, Thayer David then comes back as in, in another role. But, 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 but as far as Sandor is concerned, I, it, I thought that he and Grayson play very well again. Yeah, each yeah, other. definitely. And you know, my big fat Sandor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were having a blast. You can tell they were having a great time playing those characters mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. what could easily have been uh, these sort of caricatures? You know, these sort of stock characters they imbued them with feeling uh, because you know they cared about each other uh they were like an old married couple they would tease yes. each other they'd get on each yes. other's nerves yes and but they underneath that 
they loved each other very much. And you That's really right. feel, as you mentioned, you know, Sandor uh, gets killed. What a sad ending, you know, Ma- Magda's heart, bro- you know, they, they clearly love each other. And, and Sandor yep. expresses that too, with regard to, to Magda, that, you know, how much he loves her. There is definitely that, um, they feel like an old married couple. And I, I love that about those characters. They're not just caricatures. There's more to them than that, which was great. You know, I think that speaks to their skills, uh, their skill as actors and the writers on the show as well. I agree. I agree. Uh, so then moving on to now Count Patafi. Yes. Are we moving on to? <laughs> yeah, let's the talk hand, about Mr. The Count. Collins, the hand. <laughs> <laughs> And Thayer David, that was a tour de force uh, oh, yeah. for, for, for Thayer David. Yes. Um, and uh, according to Wiki, uh, he lived till 130. He was born in 1747. And of course, the original alias of Victor Fenn Gibbon mm-hmm. and uh, the Earl of Hampshire was his alleged friend. And mm-hmm. he comes and introduces himself to Edward, Edward Collins. And uh, so... The, the bottom line, of course, is the plot uh, talks about him uh, getting the hand, the powerful hand uh, mm-hmm. back. Uh, the What was the name of that horror movie uh, that I think this was a takeoff on uh, with, the, with the disembodied hand? Uh, it had Peter, Lor- Port Peter Laurie in it. Um, yeah, yeah. I know what I, oh. You know, so, so the plot, of course, revolved around uh, not only him getting the hand back, but the mind exchange. The beast with five fingers, sorry. Oh, the beast with five fingers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. There you go, there you go. So th- there's there's that and uh, the, oh, and that he used to be a werewolf, uh, Count, uh, Count Patafi. He yeah. used to be a werewolf. Uh, and that brings me back to uh, Werewolf of London, yeah. uh, I think, uh, you know, where that, of course, with Henry Hull and Warner Oland. Sure, yeah. Uh, so there's all, you know, uh, although there's another little takeoff on that, another segment of Shadows when you're talking about Sabrina and Chris sure. and, the, yeah. and the moon the plant. Moon, and the, the moon, moon pot, the, yeah. The moon pot, yeah. But the other interesting thing about, and, and again, a great tour de force, Mm -hmm. uh by uh thayer david who literally that was a new character and he made that character his own and uh the uh the the whole gypsy subplot with uh with with johnny romano and uh Mm -hmm. and aristide and of course yes uh, yes. strokers michael strokers aristide sure uh you know and oh my boy and uh yes i loved when patofi would always talk to aristide and say that or or quentin who yes my boy you know yes yes, my boy my (laughs) my boy uh, uh, um, and then, of course, Patofi, uh, I love when he possesses Jameson and we have the Jameson Patofi, which is wonderful. Uh, David Hennessy must have yes. also had a blast playing was a great, Thayer yeah, David was a, as Count Patofi. It's a great role. And then also, wasn't there a mind switch between Selby and... Uh, yes. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Selby, yeah Selby Even and, Selby and Patofi. And yeah. Patofi. So yeah. Thayer David is portraying Quentin. In, yes, yeah. yes, yes. We could say that is even another role for Thayer David that he played Quentin too. I didn't even think of that. Exactly. You're right. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was, I think, in terms of, yeah, they they they, they gave they gave everything the kitchen sink there, and yeah. uh, and and I think that this was, uh, and, and certainly the greatest amount we we'd be here another hour talking about the Potofi. Oh, plot, we could have a whole uh, which, episode. They're just talking about just the plot and the character. Well, I'll be, that'll be for another time. He's a great, great character. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. What, what, what were you well, the, the, you know, I was going to say that, you know, but then, and of course, the Charles Delaware Tate. Oh, uh, yes. Between Patafi yeah. and Charles Delaware Tate. Yes, Davis. the Faustian bargain. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so there's the, the, the theory in. Uh, Wiki is that he that the Toffee character might have been inspired by Count Saint Germain. Yes, I've heard uh, that before. There are some so, several sources I think that were pulled from for Patofi, but I think that's definitely could be one of them. The immortal Count Saint Germain. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, no doubt, the most extensive in terms of character development 
yeah. that Thayer David played. Sure. So, so he was great. Yeah. Think of anything else? I think yes. I'm, oh, I love Count Patofi. Uh, Count Andreas Patofi. I just great character created by Violet Well, writer Violet Wells. Uh, the 1897 storyline is sensational. Like if you don't ever, if you don't watch any other part of Dark Shadows, which you should, you should watch it all. But 1897 is, I think, is really an amazing storyline. It's uh, Sam Hall, Gordon Russell, and Violet Wells were all on their A game during that uh, that storyline. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And she created, she actually created the character of Kampato. She came up with the idea of this character Kampatofi and and see it. Violet Wells did. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm, she was still on uh, at that point. That's interesting because yeah. I, I know she was on uh, in, during the first year, but I didn't know they brought her back. No, Violet Wells was was okay. in uh, in uh, writing writing eighteen. Violet Wells was writing in in the eighteen ninety seven uh, okay, storyline. She back. was friendly with. She knew Gordon Russell, and I knew she did okay. some ghost writing for Gordon Russell for some of his okay. scripts. And then she, because she was a, like a theatrical agent, she was, uh, she was, right. she was a writer as well, but she wasn't really writing television. But they brought her in. Uh, Gordon, I think Gordon Russell, you know, introduced her. She met Dan Curtis, and and Dan Curtis brought her in ultimately. But she was working on eighteen ninety. So she seated in this character Count Patofi, where she they name dropped him earlier, and then it just turned into a thing. Like you know, Count Patofi became this entity, yeah. you know, and they brought him exactly. into the show as this great mage character. Like, and, and you see this distinction too. And someday I'm going to do an episode where I talk about this and really nerd out about this. But the, the distinction with you have the warlock type characters with with Blair and uh, Nicholas Blair and Judith Zachary, but Patofi is not as much from gothic fiction as from uh, dark fairy tales or dark fantasy stories, right? Because he's more of a mage or a wizard, you know, he's this uh, ancient wizard who lived in the forest of Ajdan and got his magical hand chopped off. It was the last mm -hmm. known person mm -hmm. to own a unicorn, killed the unicorn because he was mm -hmm. cursed as a werewolf. I'm like, wow, this is this stuff is crazy. This is really, <laughs> really crazy stuff. I'm like, wow, this, this is like a, I'm, I'm listening to like a scary uh, fairy tale story, you know, about yeah. this wizard. And then there he is, he comes into the show. And I think, you know, we mentioned the beast with five fingers. I think also the monkey's paw was also yes, at absolutely. play as well absolutely. with that hand, you know, the, the evil, the hand that can grant wishes, but at a price, but mm -hmm. in a much more <laughs> malignant way, I think. So we have this, this character who comes in, I think part also, also partially, the influence there uh, was, uh, you know, Sydney Greenstreet's character in the Maltese Falcon. Because we have the Sydney Greenstreet, Peter Lorre. We keep bringing up Peter Lorre, which, of course, you can never bring up Peter Lorre enough because he was amazing. But uh, I love Peter Lorre. But uh, but you know, it's, it, that's sort of a sort of a parallel, I think, to Count Patofi and Aristide. So that mm -hmm. there's that element as well from from film noir. But um, there was a fan years ago who posted on the Dark Shadows forums, which is a great uh, group. It's a message board forum that's run by sure. the my mysterious benefactor and Midnight and Dom are the administrators. I've been a member of that forum for many years and it's mm -hmm. it used to be much more active before Facebook came along, but people still do post on it. And uh, a fan called himself Phil Philippe Cordier, of course. <laughs> I mean, that's his name <laughs> on the forum, Philippe Cordier. Cordier. Uh, yeah. posted on the Dark Shadows forums a link to an article which he felt was also part of the inspiration for Count Patofi. And I, I actually found it and, and just copied a little bit. It was a, a, a real life count named Count Jan Pataki. Okay, P O T O C K I. Count Pataki, uh -huh. Pataki uh -huh. was an 18th and 19th century Polish soldier which Count Patofi was a soldier too. He talks about uh, sure, Lord sure. Kitchener, a uh, soldier with a fascination for the occult and secret societies. He crafted his own set of tales called the manuscript found in Saragasso. So it's actually, you can find him on Wikipedia, uh, this manuscript found in Saragasso. Um, this count believed he was becoming a werewolf in real life and had a silver bullet. He made a silver bullet and had it blessed by a village priest and killed himself mm -hmm. because he thought he was with a silver bullet because he thought he was becoming a werewolf. Right. Look it up. It's not, it's, it's uh, uh, count, uh, count Jan Pataki, just the werewolf aspect, the mm -hmm. similarity in the name, the time period, the fact that he was a soldier. I'm like, wow, there are, there are some elements there as well. And then of course you mentioned Count St. Germain, who is this immortal right. al alchemist, you know, and so I do there like are... Chelsea Quignarber novels. And I did like those mm -hmm. novels. Oh yes. Were, yeah. Mm -hmm. They were, it was, he was a very sedate Christopher Lee, you know, with that, <laughs> uh, 
uh, you know, without without the animal lust. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. But uh, and and of course the Olivia uh, novels that uh, but, but came afterward. But mm-hmm. it, all in all, the uh, the Patafi role was probably one of the most extensive things mm-hmm. I think that uh, not perhaps I mean that was the villain. So you know, I mean, great you, villain. And Thea yeah. was great at playing villains. Oh, he was and, so good at playing villains. Yeah. And didn't you love that when Quentin was when uh, Selby with Patafi was in Selby's body and for a brief moment he went back to the present yes and, yes <laughs> and, and, and through the I Ching I think it was and uh and, and he found himself and boy I remember watching that when I was a kid and saying my god he's back and they just had it it was a real suspense moment and then he yeah. and then he's propelled back into the past yeah but yeah but that was a that was yeah. a wonderful dark shadows moment. yeah oh yeah. definitely absolutely great call on that one uh um, so, yeah so let's go to the next character so uh, Timothy, Timothy Stokes. Timothy in Stokes. Time. So now yeah. we're in parallel time, and the uh, and the alternative uh, is uh, instead of T. Eliot Stokes, we have Timothy Stokes, who is more of a villain, and he's mm-hmm. the father of Angelique and Alexis Stokes. And of course, Alexis is the uh, is the good, and Angelique is the bad one. And uh, this he also was the but he also knew a lot about the occult. But here he's more of a yes. Uh, but here he's more of a a. a trafficker uh mm-hmm. practicing black magic and uh he granted uh and and he was the he was the one behind granting angelica mortality uh, mm-hmm. by using roxanne's life force uh but in so but in so doing then of course we have angelique who has to renew her life force by by uh by becoming a succubus yeah. and uh and, and kissing all and kissing all the men on the show uh and and kissing them to death including the only scene that i recall the only love scene i recall with louis edmonds on the show uh, where he kissed oh, Louis, yeah. where she kissed yeah. Louis Edmonds, and he drops yeah. dead. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, but uh, Timothy, uh, yeah. So so Timothy was more of a minor role, I think. I I don't think it. He he didn't have as much of a role as. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he you know he dressed in he dressed in black, which helped his weight. He was he was like the you know in uh, Star Trek the mirror universe you know the parallel yes. universe the evil Spock. This exactly. Is, this is like the evil Stokes with his you know. The evil Stokes seedy, with the mustache. Very yeah. seedy, unsavory personnel with a cigarette in his hand all the time and the the drink you know whatever brandy it, or whatever and, and he had that secret room in the back of the house there yeah. you know where. where <laughs> He something kept Roxanne's kinda, body. Yeah, there was something nasty about that version of Stokes for sure. The bad Stokes. <laughs> it would always have been interesting to see. I always fantasize of what would it have been had uh had, had oh well for one thing had, had Professor Stokes met th- met this Stokes. Sure. Yeah. And uh Professor Stokes probably would have thrown up his hands and run away in disgust. Yeah, yeah. Uh because you know, and, and forget about it, but Ben would have said it's at, at, at something like this. But uh so not a lot to say about this one except that he was a heavy mm-hmm. and Thayer once again you know he did what he, he did what he was told to do but but it, once again now we see that his ability to portray a heavy is very very helpful for the Dark Shadows plot line yeah and ultimately results in he's the one who kind of ends that storyline too by setting Collinwood ablaze you know uh, so yep. he yep. takes down Collinwood because things didn't work out with Angelique she's you know Barnabas and Julia triumph and uh Stokes will exactly take down Collinwood. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Our next character, Mordecai Grimes. So Mordecai Grimes, of course, is uh, comes onto the scene in 1840 after they get rid of Ben Stokes. And he is a farmer who is the father of both Mildred Ward and Jeremy Grimes. Mm-hmm. And uh, Jeremy Grimes, of course, is the boyfriend of uh, Carrie. Yeah. More, and, and again, this is a heavy role. Mordecai does not like the Collins family. He's afraid of witches. He thinks Quentin's a warlock. He thinks that Quentin killed his cattle, which (laughs) is a nice takeoff from the cattle dying when Barnabas first kept on uh, went onto the scene, and Joe's uncle's cattle were dying because yeah. uh, yeah. Barnabas is having a meal there. So here, uh, Quentin he thinks that Quentin killed the cattle so he could steal his lamb from him, even though Quentin said he wanted to buy it instead. And of course, we have the witchcraft trial for of Quentin, and then uh, Mordecai is killed by Gerard Stiles, 
uh, before he could testify. Mm-hmm. And of course, you're being under the possession of Judah Zachary. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, Mordecai, to his last, thought Quentin was a witch. And that was heard by Carrie and Charles Dawson. That was Humper Down on the Strato's character. And it was used as evidence. So again, another... Uh, and, and this looks a little bit like the Reverend Strack character in Night of Dark Shadows mm-hmm. yeah. uh, in terms of the physical appearance. I think they kind of borrowed mm-hmm. from that. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, there were very few scenes uh, in Night of Dark Shadows with uh, Strack. Uh, but uh, so once again, now you have um, Mordecai. Now, that, so now you have another role. You know, now yeah. you have another role. He wasn't yeah. a he wasn't an, he wasn't a very prominent character. Nope. It was only in a few another episodes, one. but I I always thought of him as sort of the the male equivalent of Abigail Collins in a way because he's very similar to. He's only in two episodes. He was only in two yeah. episodes. Yeah, 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 yeah. They talk about him in other episodes, but yeah, right. he only. But he right. kind of had that Abigail Collins like very uh, judgmental fears. Sees witches That's everywhere. Thinks the call. Yep. Yeah, yep. thinks Quentin's yep. a, uh, is a warlock. He's, yeah, he's, you know, he's my, a male. Yep, he's a male. Kind of, in a way, I know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, Abigail was a much more prominent character in a lot of episodes, but had sure. that same similar viewpoint on the world. Very judgmental, holier than thou, you know. Yeah, so uh, it's definitely serves a. He, it was great that he created that character. Very New Englandy too. He also brought back that kind of New England uh, exactly. style uh, accent that he put put on for for that character for sure. Exactly. Yeah, and, and then w- finally, oh, I'm sorry. F- no, no, that's all right. And then finally, uh, the par- the parallel time Ben Stokes. Yes, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, he was only on two episodes there. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's the father of. Uh, he's the father. I don't remember too much about about that one because uh, yeah. he was only on for two episodes. Yeah. Uh, he, what what he, happened to him? He was well. The the Ben of of eighteen forty one parallel yeah. time. I think. So we see Ben in 1840, and right. he's very old, very, very right. old. But the right. Ben of 1841 parallel time is not, he's middle-aged, he's not super old. So I always okay. figured, well, this must be the son of, or of the son of, of the previous Ben. That, they don't say that in the show, but it's no, the only explanation because the parallel Ben should be just as old as the, the real-time Ben. So it must be that he, maybe he was the that Ben's son and his name was also Ben, but he's the, he's a, he's Carrie's father. as he opposed to, father. As he opposed to, yeah, yeah, as opposed to the grandfather. He's, you know, similar in terms, he lives on the, uh, on the estate, lives in the cottage on the estate. He mm-hmm. helped. He's a caretaker on the property in 1841 right. parallel time, right. um, but he's uh, a little more. I'd say not. I wouldn't say refined, but a little bit more so than Ben. He, his clothes are certainly more are, are fancier. I would say than what Ben Stokes wears. You know, uh-huh. Uh-huh. Uh, so he has more a little bit more. I, I would say refinement to him uh gotcha. and he's the one who at the he has the final lines in in the entire series yes. you know and he said i would swear if i didn't know better i would swear that uh she was attacked by a vampire it was some something to, if i didn't know better i'd swear there was a vampire at collinwood it, you know it was it yeah. W- yeah well carol in that last scene uh the, the melanie. melanie character yeah. is is attacked is, is attacked and thayer david does the final voiceover yeah uh to the to that show yeah and uh, it sure. was a tremendous letdown. Uh, the- <laughs> yeah. How did you feel when you saw that? Because, and actually, just a side note, trivia bit. That last line was supposed to be delivered by Jonathan Frid as Bramwell about the the vampire. If I didn't know better, I'd swear there was a vampire. Collinwood and Frid mm-hmm. wouldn't say the line because he thought it was too tongue in cheek because he had played Barnabas previously and they thought it, he I mean, thought it was, was too much of was, a wink. And so yeah. f- they brought Thayer wasn't even supposed to be in that final episode. And they brought him back to deliver the line be- to the, the vampire at Collinwood line because Fred wouldn't say it. So Thayer luckily actually ended up being in that final episode. And as Stuart Manning said on the Dark Shadows news page, which is a great page. I don't know if Stuart uh, updates it as often now, but Stuart, it's a great website for Dark Shadows information. Sure. And he put, uh, he, he wrote, uh, this is Stuart's words, even though it happened by fluke, somehow it seems right that Thayer David, the actor who played more characters on Dark Shadows than any other, performed its curtain call. And I he agree. did that last narration. But I'm sorry, uh, how did you feel when when that 
rolled at the end. Did you? You must have. That, that is a very was, understated ending. It's definitely not what you would expect for the ending of Dark it, Shadows. It, was, it wasn't. It wasn't. And, uh, and we don't I, see the I, present day characters again. It's like, aren't we going back to? No, I would have. I would feel. I feel that way. You know, like why didn't we go back to at least see like one well, week in the present time? You know, in the <laughs> fandom, there is a blog called I think Dark Shadows Resurrected, mm -hmm. where they actually pick up. Uh, and I'm oh, starting to read that. Is that, that. Charles Delaware Troll, right? Wrote those. That's, <laughs> isn't that? Know. Yeah, it's a guy, right? Charles Delaware Troll. That's the nick, the name, nickname oh, that they use. Funny. And they wrote like all these episodes, one more year of Dark Shadows. Exactly. They did that. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. great. It's, so it's it really picks, good, actually. Yeah. It picks up right where uh, after, uh, you know, after 1841 Parallel Time, it goes right back to the present and what would, what would have happened uh, because we ended it uh when uh barnabas and julia and stokes came back and uh, t elliot stokes came back from because that was the only time t elliot stokes went back in time to 1840 yes. and, uh, and they are played three, three characters in one time absolutely, period absolutely <laughs> absolutely and uh and so they went back so we must remember also that t elliot stokes was in 1840 as well and yeah. so they and then they came back and uh and the last the last you know liz was Liz was coming back. Uh, everything was normal, and Liz was going yeah. out to some opera, opera event or something like that. Was it Roger was doing a re? Uh, uh, was it the Collins? Well, actually, the Historical Society. They so were going to go to some kind of a speech. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, and and so Liz was, and, and Joan Bennett, of course, was there also. But yeah, so the uh, the the last, the very last scene of Dark Shadows, again, I just naively said, "Oh no, it, it's got it, it's it's it, it can't be password. It can't, it can't." And uh, so it was, it was a big disappointment. It was a big disappointment. They, I obviously had to end it. They were canceled. Uh, they wanted to give it now. Sam Hall, True to Life. Uh, and you and Grayson Holt's husband did come up with uh, whatever happened to the cast of Dark Shadows, that big article on TV, in TV Guide. Right. Which uh, I, I definitely don't think most of that would have happened. <laughs> Even though Sam Hall wrote it, I don't I don't buy. Look, Dan Curtis was the de facto head writer on Dark Shadows. He would have made the decisions as to what would go right. on and what right. didn't go on. Right. And as much as I admire Sam Hall and think he was absolutely brilliant as a writer, very witty and gr wonderful scripts that he wrote, I'm sure he would have certainly also had his ideas as to what to do. But there's so much that happens in that article that I don't think could have happened under like the the world hopping and uh, bringing back characters who couldn't I be know. on the show anymore. I know. On the, I know. It, it was a it was kind of like him fantasizing about what he would have done. But well, that's I, so that's a I, lot better than what originally some they had some comedian writer uh come on tv oh. guide and come up with that yeah horrible, i know i hate that horrible article. uh dr hoffman made dr hoffman a man and he didn't yeah. even know and of course originally julia hoffman was supposed to be a man but this right. guy didn't know about it and uh he mocked know, the show he went on he wrote an article that mocked the show basically it was a terrible yeah. oh i was so mad and i and, you know somebody and now i remember it's been years ago but i wrote a nasty letter to tv <laughs> good good <laughs> <laughs> and i got a and I got a postcard from them back. Thank you very much for your. Da, 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 da. And I think that that led them to reach. I, I, this is my. I don't know if it's true, but I. But it, but I have an idea that there was so much of an outcry from that horrible mm -hmm. article, uh, that 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 horrible that horrible comedic uh, parody. Yeah. That they that they got Sam Hall to write a serious version. Yes. Yes. Uh, I think that that ha uh, that's my. I, I could be you're wrong. Probably wrong. No, you're probably right. I'm sure you're right about that because I'm sure a lot of fans had the same reaction you did and were wrote in and were, were furious about it. And it was bad enough that they took it off the way they didn't replace it with password. This was like adding, rubbing salt on the wounds. Right. It really right. was. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, so it's I, great I, that they did bring Sam Hall back to, or to, they had to, Sam Hall write to, that to give some sense of closure, even though I feel like some fans consider that hard canon for the show. I'm like, well, it's a kind of what, even in the article itself, Sam Hall said this is a possible path that the characters may have taken. You know, he even he acknowledges that. It's like, I don't think some of the things they that happened there would have been in the show. Some may have, though, you right. know. Uh, so you know, who knows? There's no way to know what would have happened at that point. Where all the Everybody involved with the show by the end was really burned out. Dan Curtis was said well, many Dan times. Dan Curtis wanted to go done. to Hollywood. Yeah. Dan Curtis had, had decided and, yeah. and, 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 you know, yeah. and, he was and he just ran movies. out of ideas. 
is. And Fred, uh, Fred was tired. I think there were many more ideas they could have implemented yes, into the show, but, like from classic literature, but they, they certainly could have, but they were, t- I think everybody was ready. But ABC to had on. pulled the plug. ABC yeah, had pulled the plug. Yeah. And the guy who canceled the show, I heard got flack from his wife and daughter, <laughs> fans, uh, the big shot. Of, and then to this day, I don't even know if he's still alive, but for a long time, he said, oh my God, he, I didn't hear the end of it uh, from my family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> for, for for doing that uh, in ter- in terms of the way they did, but it's it's here uh, all yeah. these years later uh, for everybody to enjoy. And I do want, and of course, for and for those newbies who are interested in Sam Hall's recitation, that's on YouTube. Roger Davis uh, did a narration yep. of that article, and you can get it on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, so yep. uh, and- it's uh, so so it's there. So I guess. With and my God, uh, time flies when you have. Wow! Fun, yeah, we were. My original plan was, you know, keep these episodes to an plan? hour and fifteen what minutes. Plan? So much. that goes right out the window. So Absolutely. much for plans. Uh, Absolutely. but that, but that's okay because, as you said, it's time flies when you're having fun. Tom, it was a pleasure having you on the show. How can fans find out about the Literary License podcast? I'm glad you asked that, uh, <laughs> Penny, aka Danielle. Um, we so uh, for those people who are interested, um, we, uh, the website is www.llpodcast one word dot com, and uh, we are on just as many. Uh, outlets as you are, Penny. We're on uh, Podbean, Spotify, uh, iHeart, iTunes. Uh, oh my God. Uh, Amazon. MIC- Amazon. Yes, we're on Amazon Prime. Yeah. M-I-C-K-E-Y-M-O-U-S-C. I mean, <laughs> we are uh, it, it's, an, it's an incredible, we have, and you know, Dark Shadows isn't, isn't the only thing that's done on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, we, there are broadcasts every week, uh, regarding a book to screen, uh, Bewitched, uh, we're, they're doing right now. Uh, they're doing soap, uh, once every three months. Uh, they're doing like, uh, kind of like Twilight Zone-ish, uh, Man versus Nature yeah. is one of them. Uh, it's very extensive. So every week is a different, uh, every week theme. Is a, different topic yeah that's correct dark shadows is once a month but we are going to twice a month uh, Mm -hmm. as of september because Mm -hmm. we will be winding this up in september of 2022 so uh in order to do that in order to make room for other stuff but we've got other dark shadow surprises after that and i'm going to shut my mouth and you guys have interviewed a lot of the people involved with the show which has been really fun to listen to yeah well, I'm very proud to say, and thank you for mentioning that uh, we've had a, a, we've had some great support from the surviving cast members. Mm-hmm. Roger Davis has given a lot of time to us. Uh, he was our first guest, and uh, as uh, we and he was on our he, he was on one of our uh, podcasts, and he also did a long interview with me, during which. He was driving in his car in, in downtown LA and he passed the gas station that was being held up. So you heard oh, the gunshots yeah. as that was wow. going by. Wow. Oh, a lot of, but oh my God, to Laura Park, Laura Parker, Catherine Lee Scott, Adam Carlin, the son of John. John was scheduled to be with us and he passed. Um, yeah. Jim Storm and his wife. Uh, great people, lovely, lovely people. Yeah. Marie Wallace uh, just came on. Robert Rodan before he passed. We got Buzz. We got we got uh, Michael uh, Hedge. Michael Hedge. Yeah. Uh, nobody interviewed Michael. That Hedge was amazing. And I yeah, and I got him. And uh, and some and 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 forgive me if I'm blanking out on the. But in, I listened but, to Chris Pennock's interview recently. That was Chris great. was so, yes the late great Chris Pennock. What a yeah, what a I, loss. So sad him and uh, Robert Rodan recently. So, but I'm so glad you were able to. Robert talk to Rodan, him. we were we were told to interview. Well, we were told by his son that he didn't have a long. He didn't have long. Oh, so gosh. after he was interviewed, they're saying get the, get it up there because yeah. we don't know if he's going to be alive. Oh my and, goodness! And, and we made a special effort to do it, and thankfully. Robert heard it. He yeah. loved it, yeah. and um, and and I think five or six months later he was gone. Yeah. But uh, and Chris Pennock, you had the Chris Pennock interview. Chris which, Pennock and Chris which, is what a wow, what a spitfire. So fun. I was listening like to that. One? Oh gosh, I loved it. But I was so sad. I was sad too. But it was yeah. so great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. His enthusiasm yeah. and sense of humor and yes. uh, just play playfulness in the episode with you. And, uh, you know, at one point he was reading his comic book and doing a reading of it and you were interrupted to say something. He was like, how dare 
why you interrupted. <laughs> and I just lost it. I was cracking I, I must up. I also tell you that Chris was very fond of four, five, and seven letter words as well. Yes. <laughs> so that was one of the saltiest interviews I ever did. And he's saying, come on, Tom, why can't you say, ah? and I'm like, okay, Chris, I say, ah. <laughs> yeah, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, you know, so he was, but 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 he was marvelous, and, and as you said, Marie Wallace sure. was very very. And we have some more coming up. Oh, uh, good, excellent. So, uh, yeah, so be sure uh, we we hold some of these until the characters come on, and then we bring the stars on as a right. general rule. So yeah. be sure that so be sure to listen to us. And be sure to listen to the next one where uh, Danielle, a.k.a. Penny, is going to be our guest star. I'm and looking forward to it very much. Absolutely. And I thank you once again for right. allowing me. I had a great time. A well, great time. thanks, Tom. It was a pleasure talking with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the show. Uh, you are definitely uh, a fan who knows their stuff and knows these characters and loves these characters so much. And I could tell that from listening to you on the show that you care a lot about the uh, about the the show and the actors and the characters. Yes, and I, I really and I that just when I hear you talk about Thayer David, especially, I could tell I was like, well, he really he really does like Thayer a lot. So I wanted yes, to I, did. I wanted to honor him as well and i thought you would be a great guest uh, to do that so thank you for joining me it's a privilege hearing that from you and roger davis actually had listened to the thayer david impression and and he paid me a compliment because he said how did you get thayer how did you get and i said roger that wasn't thayer that was me and, <laughs> and, and 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 i was very pleased by that but i but i am very pleased to have lent, lent whatever little voiceover talents I have uh, to the show uh, because uh, it is, uh, this is legacy. Uh, what we do now, what you and I do here and what, and what you're doing on your podcast and what Keith is doing on his is preserving dark shadows uh, for generations of people to come. And there's nothing more <laughs> important in, yeah. in my view than, uh, than making that happen. So thank you very much for your for your help with this. Oh, gosh, thank you. Folks, if you get a chance, check us out on terror at Collinwood.com. And uh, there's a blog section. There's going to be some really fun stuff happening. By the time you're listening to this, there will probably already be something really fun on there. So I encourage you to go to terror at Collinwood.com. Check out the blog section because there it, I'm going to be posting some really fun things there periodically, Not certainly not every week or even every month, but periodically I'll post something cool there. And by the time you listen to this, it should be there by then. So, And if, and if you have any comments, by the way, regarding mm -hmm. the Literary License Podcast, please be sure to email us at info, I-N-F-O, at LLPodcast.com. Definitely. Uh, we we want to hear good uh, animal, vegetable, mineral. We hope they'll all be good, but we'll take them all. <laughs> we'll take it all in stride. Fantastic. All right. And with that said, remember, Dark Shadows is a Dan Curtis production. <laughs>